seeing a presence of the quorum, calling the meeting of the Amherst School Committee to order at 6.01 p.m. Welcome, everyone. This is a nice full house. Um, and I don't know if the uh, Fort River Feasibility Study Committee wants to also call this meeting to order right now or? quorum quite yet. too short. Okay, so you're waiting for quorum. Okay. So um, I guess once that happens, if that happens, just let me know and we'll, we'll take a break to do that. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so first order of business is approving the uh, Amherst School Committee minutes of November 5th. And so, um, if I can get a motion from the committee. Mr. Demling? I uh, move to approve the minutes of November 5th, 2018. Okay. Second. Thank you. Give you a minute to review this and do uh, you have any edits or comments? Uh, all those in favor, signify by raising your hand. All right, thank you. That meeting minutes of November 5th are approved. All right, uh, moving along, we're going to announcements first and then uh, public comment. So are there any announcements from the committee? Mr. Demling? So this will be a broken record to the committee, but um, given that this is the last week uh, that public will be able to take action, I just wanted to remind Everyone in the community again who's focused on um, public school and funding uh, that there is a charter school that's proposing to expand uh, and that you can provide your input to charter schools at doe.mass.edu that goes to the Commissioner of Education um, to provide your input before Monday. Um, and uh, I, you know, I, I just want to take opportunity to, not only because this is our last meeting before that, but you know, we have a great assembly today of people who have been engaged in local issues, sometimes in spirited disagreement, and I feel like this is an issue that really crosses those uh, specific disagreements. We, we lose more than $3 million a year that Amherst Public Schools do to charter schools. Um, that could likely increase to $5 million given this, the, this expansion would more, more than double, or almost double the, the charter school in size, and um, I've been very encouraged by the level of support from our select board, from uh, town meeting last year, which called for a moratorium on charter school expansions, the NAACP, which has called for a national moratorium on charter school expansions, and also the strong statements from our Senator-elect Joe Comerford and Representative-elect um, Mindy Dome. Um, it's been a lot of, of, of unity on that, that front, but, um, but this, is, this is not the kind of broken formula that should rob some schools to, to fund some others. So. Um, I know that this is the third year we're asking people to do this, so it stinks um, that this, this is the process we have. And so I apologize for the advocacy fatigue, um, but uh, if this goes through, that's it. And then we'll be talking about major cuts in the very near future. Uh, so if you consider taking this action and also sharing it uh, with your friends through whatever electronic means is most appropriate for you, that would be appreciated. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Dunley. Any other announcements from the committee? Quorum's appearing. Okay. Okay, so uh, Mr. Selvin, do you want to take a moment to call your, your committee to order? I will, I will call to order the Fort River School Feasibility Committee. Great. And let the record reflect that. It's uh, 6 05 p.m. Welcome. Um, okay, and so with that, we will move to public comment. Uh, if anyone has any public comment they would like to make, please come up to the microphone, state your name, and you have three minutes. Catherine Oppie, and I just want to appreciate Mr. Demling's uh, broken record announcements. I, th I think it's really helpful. Um, I'm also going to sound a little bit like a broken record because people have heard me say this before. But um, so, uh, as we think about the infrastructure concerns regarding the elementary schools tonight, and listen to the progress of the Fort River feasibility study, I want to remind the committee of some of the consequences of our failed attempt to build two new schools in Amherst. Tonight, you're going to hear an estimate for how much it will cost the town to keep both Wildwood and Fort River open for two-thirds of our students and teachers. We know that roofs and boilers and HVAC systems are expensive and necessary 
to make Wildwood and Fort River and Fort River usable. What we are not talking about tonight, but probably should be, is that after we spend millions of dollars, certain educational realities will still be true in both buildings. For example, there are no permanent walls and classrooms in grades one through six in either building. There is very limited or no natural light in all first through sixth grade classrooms in both buildings. The district will see no operational savings with either building and instead will see huge increases in capital expenses over the next several years. Many children will continue to be bused out of their enrollment zones and away from their neighbors and siblings, either based on their special educational needs or their family's socioeconomic status. Our programs for our most educationally vulnerable students will continue to be housed in classrooms without permanent walls and will continue to deal with constant interruptions from noise from other students, some who need to walk through the classroom to use the restroom. Neither of these buildings are or will be ADA accessible. In 2016, a statewide teacher survey in answer to the question, the physical environment of classrooms in this school support teaching and learning, the, average, the state average of teachers answering yes to that question was 83%. At Crocker Farm, that number rose to 93%. But at, at Wildwood, the number was only 24%, and at Fort River, it was 9%. Given the reports from teachers who came before this school committee this past fall, I believe those numbers at Fort River and Wildwood would be even lower today. The main entrance to both Fort River and Wildwood is 82 feet from the front door. Visitors walk by several instructional areas in a main hallway before checking in at the main office. Building costs go up approximately 3.5 to 4% a year. If we take a one building at a time approach, the most likely scenario for getting all of our students and teachers into new buildings with classroom walls is sometime between 2033 and 2037. That means that today's kindergartners will be graduating from high school and another generation of students will have gone through these educationally unacceptable buildings. So as you consider asking the town for millions of repair dollars, and listen to the Fort River Feasibility Study update, I want you to keep these facts and figures in mind and ask for the minimum amount necessary to keep these buildings open. I am ever hopeful that we can have all our students and teachers in new buildings sooner rather than later. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments? I'm sorry, you can come up to the, the mic. <coughs> but would be a chance of, for public comment after the presentation? We haven't uh, discussed that, but it's up to both committees to decide if that's the case. Thank you. I said it would make good sense so that we would all be looking at the information. Any other public comments? Okay, seeing none, we'll close public comments. Um, so moving on to the superintendent's update. So thank you, and I'll keep this brief for two reasons. One, there's a lot of people here for the next topic, and also a, a lot of the updates relate to dual language update, which is later on the agenda. Um, so I think I'll just uh, mention four things. So um, before the holiday, uh, November 15th, we had our first meetings of the English Learners Parent Advisory Council. Um, and thanks to Ms. Richardson, who you've met multiple times this fall, uh, for facilitating that. I know it's on our agenda later, so maybe I'll share a little more details about the work that happened and then future work that the LPAC is considering at that point. I want to thank uh, Chair Adonez <coughs> for attending the Puerto Rican flag raising. That was on November 19th. It was. Um, Thank also Ms. Chamberlain, who's here, for bringing fifth and sixth grade students, who were wonderful to have in the audience. Um, this was an event that wasn't typically owned by the school, it was owned by the town, and just one of these things that happens where um, someone needed to take on that, um, that mantle. So and Dr. Guevara, uh, who worked in our director, who worked in our family center, did that, and she organized the event. Uh, and Mr. Donis 
shared some incredibly powerful words uh, with the community of probably about 75, 80 people. I'm bad at estimating that, but that's my guess. Who were there, and I got to speak, and it was just an incredibly special day, despite the sleety weather, and you know, everyone braved it quite well. So mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to add anything on that. Uh, I would just say it was a, a wonderful event, um, and I, I think it was really particularly amazing because we had a couple of young uh, students yes. who uh, just astounded me with their the level of confidence and uh, poise that they had. Um, we had one student who was singing, another student who, who gave this amazing speech. Uh, just a really great event, so thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you for attending. Uh, Thursday is Fort Rivers having a family literacy night. Um, you can see the information below, but thanks to all the Fort Rivers staff and as we do for our family events, we also provide bus transportation for um, folks who might need it. Um, so we we'll look forward to that. And I think the last thing also staying on the Fort River theme tonight is um, that the commissioners <coughs> visit. Um, so the commissioner, Jeff Riley, will uh, if he visits one, at least one school a week, and he's going to be in Western Mass for something or other, so he's choosing to visit Fort River. Um, so that'll be a really nice thing next week, uh, or the week after next, excuse me. And he's going to visit fourth and sixth grade classrooms, and what he likes to do as a former teacher is talk to students, not just observe, but actually interact with students. And the last half of the hour, he's going to get a tour that Ms. Chamberlain's going to lead, and I'll be there with Ms. Cunningham. And as it mentioned, we're concerned a little bit about quorum issues, but I think the chair and vice chair are able to attend that as well. So we'll share about that experience um, at the next Amherst School Committee meeting. Mm -hmm. and I think I'll save the rest of the updates for kind of isolated items that are already on the agenda, if that's okay with the chair. Sure. Any questions or comments from the superintendent about his update on the committee? Okay. All right, let's uh, move along then to the next item, uh, which is the Fort River Feasibility Study Discussion. Uh, and this is also part of the joint meeting with the Fort River Feasibility Study Building Committee. Um, and so I've asked or invited uh, the committee to actually come and sit up front over here. There's also a couple of chairs available if folks want to come up here. You will, of course, be in full view of the camera, but that's, <laughs> you're used to that, so it's okay, yeah. I think I will swap over there just Fantastic. Great. Great. Um, so just very briefly, I think uh, we've had a couple of conversations here about uh, inviting both the Chair Salvin uh, and members of the, that committee as well as uh, the designers to join us tonight so that we could hear a little bit more about uh, the work that's gone on in that committee up until now, um, and then also just discuss with this committee about what the milestones are to be and what some of the deliverables will be. Um, you know, there's been a lot of conversation in the community, of course, and obviously there's a very full room here today, so it shows how interested people are in this topic, which is great. Um, so we just want to make sure that we have um, a good, you know, sort of stepping stone for this conversation. So with that, I guess I don't know if I'm turning it over to you, Dr. Morris, or to share. If if that's okay? Yeah, so I just wanted to um, contextualize uh, kind of how we got here, and then I'll turn it over to either Mr. Nakajima or Mr. Or Mr. Salvin to then uh, introduce the group and get going with the presentation. But I think it's important to note that kind of the origins of the feasibility study and then the committee came out of a real desire, wherever people sat on the prior building project, to move the community forward and to gather critical information that was going to be essential uh, along the process of improving the conditions of our school buildings. And so that was March 2017 that we started talking about uh, what our next steps were uh, after the end of the last building project. And I think it's a critical, just, we got some calls <coughs> even, you know, Ms. Westmoreland and, and some of the schools about tonight's meeting. And I, so I, I think it's important to contextualize the importance of, of the work that's gone on is that uh, there were many lingering questions, uh, some about the Fort River site, some about building options. Um, some about project costs, some about uh, renovation models, some about size of schools, since most of the other focus of the prior project was on um, larger size schools. And so this was really essential work that the feasibility study, um, feasibility committee, excuse me, for a feasibility committee is doing because it really is going to inform the next steps as a community. Because our hope, or my hope, I should say, I'll only speak for myself, is that uh, this is this information can be used to better advance uh, a collaborative approach to really um, move the town of Amherst forward 
in supporting our students at the elementary level. Uh, everyone I speak to um, is curious about uh, what our next steps are, what the community's next steps are, the towns, the schools. And without this information, I think our next steps would be less clear. Uh, and so I really thank the committee for their steadfast work, many, many meetings and many nights in summer and all sorts of uh, other meetings that the committee went on. And I think it's critical because some, some one of the critiques that's come to me as well, there's not necessarily a building at the end of this process. And, and for me, it, that's the context is different. So for me, the context is we want to have newer renovated buildings at the end of a process, and this is part of that process. It's not necessarily the end of the feasibility process, but this is information that's critical to get to where I believe everyone in the community wants to be, which is an improved infrastructure for our elementary school students. So for me, it's a step along the way and a critical step. And so I just wanted to make sure I was contextualizing the work as, as being really um, helpful along that path. I don't know if there's anything Smakajima wants to add. No, I just, uh, okay. for sure, Salvin wants to introduce sure. the committee and the team. Indeed. And I, I, the only thing I'd add to what uh, Mr. Morris has said is that um, just to con contextualize where we are, the work of the committee, um, we've been working for a couple months now um, with TSKP Studio. Um, they've developed a range of options, and that's part of what we're going to see tonight. Um, and just to kind of reinforce what Mike said, while we don't come to, to a building at the end of this committee's process, um, we do provide, I think, some really valuable information on what the options are um, on that site and with the building. So with that, I will, I will introduce our design team leads from TSKP Studios. Good evening. Hello. Uh, Madam Chair and members of the uh, committee, my name is Richard Sipek. I'm an architect. With me is Jesse Saylor, also an architect. Uh, and we've been spearheading this effort on behalf of the Feasibility Committee. So this is a work in progress. What I'm going to share with you is the work that we've developed so far. We still have work to do ahead of us. Um, so this is just a, a, a summary of what, what we've done. And ultimately, what we will deliver to the Feasibility Committee is um, some analytic information, some data, some diagrams that will be part of a report, a bound report. Um, some modeling for economic uh, analysis as well. Uh, next. So for this evening, our presentation goal is to give you a brief introduction as to who we are why we're qualified to undertake this study, and then give you an update on that feasibility study. Uh, we want to review the options, and there are many options. We've tried to narrow it down to some sensible ones. Um, and then we would request your feedback. Next. So first, who are we? A TSKP studio was actually formed in 1970. Uh, we currently have offices in Hartford and in Boston. Uh, both Jesse and I are from the Hartford office, and we've done many school projects since 1970. Uh, and I want to share with you some of the work that we've done. I think there's a common thread that runs through our work. Um, we do public schools. What I'm going to show you is public schools. These are very simple, child-friendly examples. This one happens to be an early childhood uh, school project. Next. Uh, we use scale to make sure that the projects are um, comfortable for little people. And we try to use recycled material. If you could go back to that. And we've been doing this for a very long time, long before LEED was formalized as a process. This particular example uh, uses recycled wood. It's actually wood that was salvaged from rainstorms or uh, hurricane storms, I should say. And we. Uh, had this wood purchased and it was milled specifically to create this rain screen on this exterior uh, building, which is a public school. Why rain screens? Well, it allows us to increase the insulation, increase the thickness of the insulation on the exterior walls. Next. This is recycled wood. Uh, this is a common lobby uh, in um, a building. And as you can see, there's lots of natural light, which is a recurring theme in our work as well. I believe that if we can create schools that don't need artificial lighting, we've achieved a great deal. So that's what we try to achieve as much as possible. We work with lighting consultants, daylighting spe specialists, 
to achieve that. Next. We believe, believe in, when we're programming spaces, creating multifunctional spaces so that your spaces can serve a variety of purposes. For instance, a gymnasium can also be an auditorium. That stage that you see in the background can also be a music practice room, for example. It can have two sides, one side facing the gym, another side facing the cafeteria on the opposite side, for example. Next. Uh, we believe in beautiful and durable material because you may get reimbursement from the state to build the building. You may not get reimbursement to operate the building. So it's important that whatever material you use is easy to maintain, and that comes with proper selection of material. So that's what we do when we budget a project to make sure that those kinds of affordable uh, uh, materials are included in the budget. Next. Uh, we make sure that the school spaces have connections to the outdoors, and if the schools have um, small, uh, lower age children, we make sure that those windows are low enough so they can also uh, look out the windows. And in this case, we have large spans of glass, but we also have little peekaboo windows at various heights, as you can see. Next. And s security and safety. One of my partners who has served on the Connecticut Governor's Commission on School Safety. This was after the Sandy Hook occurrence. Is also part of the team for this project. We want to make sure that safety is considered in the development of the plans. Next. Okay. Existing conditions investigations. What we've done as part of our process is engage sub-consultants to go through the Fort River School. We have mechanical engineers, um, landscape architects, civil engineers, structural engineers, as well as a sustainable green engineer. Next. I'm not going to bore you with all of the deficiencies in the building. I suspect that this committee probably has been through the building, has probably received other reports that, are, that have described those conditions. We will give you our own independent assessment of those conditions. They will be in a separate bound document that we'll, we will give to the Feasibility Committee. But I could categorize those deficiencies in these three areas. Number one is infrastructure uh, concerns. Second is educational needs, a plan that really doesn't function in delivering the curriculum that you have uh, designed for the schools. And third is security deficiencies. Next. If we look at the plan of the Fort River School, you can see that it was building that was built in the 70s. But actually, it's a model that is as old as the 50s. Um, in 1958, the Educational Facilities Laboratory uh, published a document that described schools of the future. And in that 1958 document, they talked about schools without walls. We knew when I started doing school projects back in the 70s that that was a mistake. And we were retrofitting schools that that had those kinds of spaces. So Fort River is one of the consequences of that kind of thinking, and it was faulty thinking. Uh, we know today that we do need acoustic separation, that you need visual separation, you need to be able to divide those kinds of educational spaces into a variety of smaller spaces so that you can have group activity without disrupting other pupils in the rooms. And that's unfortunately what you don't have at the Fort River School. Um, Jesse, if you could point to a typical classroom cluster such as that. That classroom cluster uh, illustrates four classrooms, but and the classrooms are actually smaller than you think. When you, when you subtract the amount of circulation that you need to go around the classrooms, you end up with spaces that are quite small. Those spaces that are, the four spaces that are within that open area are about 710 square feet, 712 square feet. I think the largest is about 724 square feet. To put that in perspective, the MSBA, which is the Massachusetts School Building Authority, they're the agency that would reimburse you should you apply for MSBA funding, uses 900 square feet per classroom as their minimum requirement. There are other flaws with this plan, um, such as the community spaces, typically the gymnasium, the library, 
the cafeteria are located in different ends of the building, <coughs> such as those areas that Jesse is pointing out. That's a gymnasium at that end. In the center is the, the media center without, without any windows. And then on the right, you have the cafeteria. In order to get to those spaces after hours, after school activities, by members of the community, you have to go through the school. And today, we plan facilities so that you can have those spaces open without opening up the rest of the school. Another um, defect we see here is that the administration area, where the principal's office is, the reception is, is quite a ways away from the front door. And that's a security risk. You can't really see, people in the office can't really see uh, people who are entering the building. Next. Um, well, we talked about open classrooms, the disruption from one activity to another. Next, uh, the lack of daylighting. There are these little courtyards, but they're very ineffective in providing outdoor views or outdoor daylighting within the educational spaces. Next. So what kind of educational spaces do you need? Next. If you look at the population that was estimated for the school, which, Jesse, if you could point that out, is 420. That's the projected number. And how do we get to that number? It's actually quite straightforward. We have a total of um, seven, I'm sorry, seven grades, K through um, six. And then we have three classrooms per grade. If you allow 20 pupils per grade, that works out to be 420 pupils. That's, that's the maximum allowable per this district standards. So if you go, in order to determine the range of options, we chose to go to the 420, and that's for those grades. Now if you add the pre-K enrollment, the projected pre-K enrollment, that would be an additional 45 um, pupils for making a total of 465 pupils. So that's the number that we're targeting in our study. Well, what does the MSBA say about that? What kind of spaces do you need? If you look at the MSBA guidelines, 465 pupils would require 72,742 square feet. But we believe, based upon our assessment, that you need 84,000 square feet. Why? If you look at the chart just below there, you have a difference of opinion on how many pupils per classroom is the correct number. According to the district, 20 is the correct number. And I don't disagree with that. Actually, if you can do fewer, I think you're better off. But that's my opinion. MSBA says you should be allocating 25 pupils per classroom. You can, you can go to 20. You don't have to adhere to the 25. But what the MSBA does is says, well, we're not going to reimburse you for that excess square footage. So if you look at the Amherst classroom guideline factor, that affects the square footage, that amounts to 4,725 square feet. In addition to that, you have the district special ed programs that are in the school, AIMS, building blocks. And then you also have the pre-K administrative area. What MSBA says when they do their calculation is because we don't want redundant administration in the school. We're not going to count the administrative spaces for the pre-K. So as far as MSBA is concerned, that's excess. So that's how we come up with uh, 85,127. We round it down. We think we can do a little bit more efficient job. So that's the disparity between our calculation and MSBA's calculation. <coughs> Next. What about the spaces within the 84,000 square feet? What the feasibility committee did is they, they asked Dr. Morris to help with this process. We've met with Dr. Morris several times, and we had tried to identify the kinds of spaces that would be needed in a population of 420 pupils in order to deliver the curriculum. And we came up with this whole list of spaces, uh, so many classrooms, uh, gym space, cafeteria of so many square feet, and so on. And if you total all of that up, and then you <coughs> add a factor for corridors and wall thicknesses, you come up with 84,000 square feet. That level of detail will be part of the report that we give to the feasibility study. 
Next. Sustainability and net zero, a subject of discussion with the Feasibility Committee and also a subject of discussion with the town. In fact, in this town, you have the requirement that any new building that's built with local funding has to be built to meet net zero requirements. That's a factor in the development of the options and the costs that are going to be part of the, the study. So let's talk briefly about that, sustainability and net zero. Next, starting with what is sustainable. I mean, it's common knowledge, common understanding that sustainable <coughs> very often means safe and healthy. It's resource efficient. It's <coughs> smart about using material. It has to be flexible and adaptable, durable and maintainable. Next. But there's a more formal definition uh, that <coughs> Massachusetts School Building Authority uses, which is something called LEED certification or New England CHIPS or the New England Collaborative on High Performance Schools. Either method of scoring sustainable buildings is acceptable to MSBA. That's the minimum requirement if you want to qualify for MSBA guidelines. And it means 10% better than the current energy code in the state. Now, the state acknowledges that that puts a burden on funding or cost on the project, so they will additionally reimburse the, di the district for projects that can further exceed the energy code by 20%. Next. So there's an incentive there. We also have energy codes that come into play, and since 1980, we are mandated by codes to continue to drop the energy consumption in school buildings. And this chart tries to illustrate that. Right now, we're at about the halfway point of where we were back in 1980. That's how much energy is mandated to be dropped, regardless of what MSBA says, what your building and energy code says. So that's a requirement. And you have now in town created the net zero obligation, which further makes it more challenging. The next chart tries to illustrate that. I'm sorry, Jesse, go back one more. Okay, you see how this is declining? Keep that downward curve in mind. Next. That downward curve is also expressed by this graph. So you see the energy demand code compliant <coughs> chart that shows the de constant decline of the energy goals and that brings us to a point. Jesse, if you could point that out at the bottom of the curve right there. Now, your net zero regulation says you have to be able to generate enough energy in your facility so that you don't have to buy any energy. That's an important point. So how do we do that? We have to create renewable energy in the project to make sure that we get to net zero. <coughs> Next. So let's talk about the design options. And I'm going to present to you a range of options from A to F. Next. That's what this chart illustrates. There are um, six that we'll talk about. Actually, there are over 100 if you look at all the variations. But I'm going to, only going to talk about six. On the left, you see option A, which is 100% new building. It also happens to be the simplest strategy in construction phasing. You build a new building, you move everyone in, you demolish the old building. Very simple phasing. On the right are options E and F. Those options are much more difficult to accomplish. Option F does not meet all your goals. It basically just uh, makes some repairs, brings you up to energy code, does not really address the educational requirements. Option E does meet all your goals, uh, but it's only 7% new construction. If you compare 7% new construction with 100% new construction, how do you achieve that with a building that's currently being used? You have to phase it. And how do you phase it? It takes you a whole lot longer you grab little pieces of the building as you go around and do renovation work is one strategy. Another strategy is you put portable classrooms 
on the site, or you find someplace else to put the children in order to renovate all of the existing building. So those are the, that's the range. Everything from 100% new, 50% new, 29, 18, all the way down to 0% new. Next. So we have in this chart, what is it, 100 147. 147 variations. Why do we get 147 variations? Well, if you look at the six options that we talked about, A through F, then we looked at different populations. What if pre-K is not in the, in the school? That's a smaller population. Makes a smaller square footage demand. What if sixth grade moves to another facility? That affects the population. So Jesse, if you could point to those variations in population, you'll see 465, that includes pre-K, 420 does not. 360, remind me what 360 is. It's, it's just a lower um, pre-K through 6 enrollment. Okay. For various reasons, whatever. Okay. And then the 315 is, I believe, the existing. If you take pre-K away again. Okay. So that's, so, the, that's the existing as well. Yeah. So in, in each column, A, B, C, D, et cetera, you see those four variations in populations. That affects footprint. Footprint affects cost. And then if you look at the column on the left side, you'll see various HVAC systems. We looked at six different possible HVAC systems. They have different initial costs. They have uh, different operating expenses in the future. They have different maintenance costs. And when we spoke with the facilities director, uh, the optimal choice was, as Jesse is pointing out on that line right there, that option six, system number six. So now if you look across the chart, you'll see there are six yellow boxes. Those are the six options we chose to illustrate and present to you. Understand that we could go on many more times and look at other options, but if I give you the, the, this maximum population in each column, that should give you a pretty good picture of the range, starting with A. Oh, by the way, all of the options address these non-negotiable goals that were established by the feasibility study. A committee, such as the natural light has to be available in all classrooms. None of these shortcuts like skylights or shortcuts like light wells, legitimate exterior walls with windows. You have to achieve that. Good air quality, good acoustics, elimination of this open classroom design. Let's make sure that the partitions are creating proper rooms. Compliance with town's net zero bylaws. One more thought about that. The town by bylaw says new buildings have to comply with net zero. So if you do 100% new, 100% of it has to be net zero. If you do 50% new, that 50% is net zero, just, just to be clear. The renovated portion does not have to be net zero to comply with your guidelines or your bylaws. Um, and so on, you can read the list. Um, it has to be fully accessible, has to meet the building and energy code compliance. Next. Okay, so let's look at option A. Uh, this aerial um, rendering illustrates, and it, you can barely see it, there's the footprint of the existing building, if just so you could outline it, is it in that general area? So we would build in the area shown in blue, that is a proposed two-story building that could satisfy all of your educational needs. That would be built adjacent to the existing footprint. Once the new building is finished, the existing building would be removed. Next. In order to meet net zero, we need to put many photovoltaic panels in the building to make this system work, to, met, to achieve net zero. So all of the pink areas that you see are photovoltaic arrays. They would be on the roof of the building, they would be in the parking lots, as well as on the ground in the field that you see. Once the new building is finished, then we would have new play fields built. Next. Uh, this is the two-story option. All of the classrooms have exterior walls, all of the spaces have daylight, and the um, entrance area, Jesse, if you could point that out, the entrance to the building would be there off the parking areas, and there's this, uh, and that's also another entrance at that end right here. 
so admin is very close to the entrance. Uh, we're minimizing the number of entrances into the building for security reasons. On the upper floors, you can see the classroom spaces arranged around the perimeter of the footprint. All of the common areas, such as the gymnasium, cafeteria, library, are all collected together. You can use those spaces after hours without opening up the rest of the building. Next. Option B. Option B, uh, I think I described before as 50% new. In this case, it's a two-story addition to the existing building and then the renovation of the remainder of the building. Next. This option has fewer photovoltaics that would be required uh, to achieve net zero in the addition. And then the renovation of the existing building would, would also be done. Next. Uh, and the overall strategy, as as shown here, we would remove a portion of the building in the core, that's that tan area uh, in the core, as well as on the left side of the footprint. The blue area is new construction, the gray is renovated. Next. When we're finished, we would have in the center of the building a courtyard, and then we would have rearranged the common areas so that they were available for use by the community after hours, and the academic areas can be separated. The academic areas, you can see all of the classrooms in orange, they would have all exterior walls and windows available. Next. I'm sorry, I'm going to ask you to pause for just one second. I just, Certainly. There's a lot of information that's been shared right now, so I just want to give a moment to the committee in case there's any clarifying questions or anything that you'd like to ask of the architect at this point. Okay. You're all speechless. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Next. Option C is 29% new. It places the addition at the opposite end of the building. Next. Fewer photovoltaics would be required, obviously, because the building, new construction is, is smaller. Next. Similar strategy. The blue is new construction. The gray is renovation. The tan area are sections of the building that would be removed. Next. And the footprint also achieves exterior walls for all of the rooms. Um, as you can see, and we've uh, located the common area so that they're available after hours. Next. Option D is only 18% new. Next. A similar strategy, fewer photovoltaics. Next, smaller new construction. Uh, in this case, we would be filling in those little courtyards that are not very effective in order to build proper square footage, legitimate separate classrooms, and we were building a um, large courtyard in the center of the building so that we have exterior walls on all the classrooms. Next. That's what this would look like. I neglected to mention that all of these plans have pre-K in the plans. Jesse, if you could point those out. Those are the darker <coughs> orange areas here. There, those are typically clustered in an area by themselves with a separate entrance because we see a lot of coming and going at different hours. Not different hours, but <laughs> they have their own schedule. <laughs> Next. Uh, and then option E, only 7% new. Similar strategy, fewer photo photovoltaics and renovation work. Next, here you can see the relatively small new construction. That would be for the pre-K area only. We would create a courtyard in the center of the building and then create proper classrooms with exterior walls all the way around. Next. So A through E fulfills all of those goals that I listed. Makes the building accessible, meets the energy codes, uh, makes uh, net zero those new construction areas. Option F fails to do that. Um, all, it do all this does, it, it achieves, as you can see in the list, it achieves abatement. We're replacing the roof, we're replacing the windows. Uh, we're reconfiguring some rooms, but we're not replacing or reconfiguring all of the rooms new sprinkler system in the building which doesn't exist, um, and so on. And that, that we chose to include in the feasibility study so that the committee could see what's the base cost. 
what's the base cost that we need to achieve in this building without all of those other goals so that you had some basis of comparison. Next. Um, do we have more than that after this? This is the last No. Slide. Okay. So what's all this cost? We haven't had that presentation with the Feasibility Committee yet. We have received some cost information for an independent cost estimator. Quite frankly, we haven't vetted those numbers yet. We want to make sure that those numbers are correct. So we would like to go through that with the Feasibility com Committee before we report it. We also want to make sure that the phasing costs for each of those options are included because phasing costs money as well. I would be happy to answer any questions. So looking to the committee at this point, or Mr. Nakajima, I don't know if you want to add any comments or? Uh, well, we'll see if I have any comments. But I did, I did have a couple. I just wanted to clarify a couple <coughs> things. I mean, you were describing earlier that there were uh, like 150 different potential variations on the building. But if I'm not wrong, the, the report we're going to be looking at at the end is going to have a distinct subset of that 150 variations, right? That's correct. It's going to have, I think it's going to have A through F, and then it'll include um, both with pre-K and without pre-K, right? Like That's correct. You, you'll be able to glean from the report the costs associated with those variations. In other words, you, you'll... With these you, variations. Yes, you will mm -hmm. see a cost for with pre-K and without pre-K. Right. But for A, for A through F, right? Yes. Okay. And then another question I had was, is our, I, I probably should know this already, but I'm, I, I'm assuming that there's going to be some, since you're describing uh, compliance with the net zero bylaw, and logically A would be 100% compliant, which would mean there'd be some estimation of the cost of construction and maintenance, but then also some impact on the operating cost because... Absolutely. You're, you're co you're, you have much more energy efficient building and you have lower electric utility costs. You're not, I hope you would. You're not buying. Right, exactly. Utilities. And and then but on the, if you go down the line, as you're describing it, you describe different alternatives, some of which were only like twenty five percent compliant or eighteen percent compliant in terms of being net zero. Correct. And so the question would be, would we anticipate seeing some sense of what the trade-off is in terms of operating efficiency and cost and things like that? Yes, we owe that information still as part of our final report to the Feasibility Committee, yes. Great, great. And, and, and just, I guess I don't want to put a fine point on it, but part of the reason I was asking those questions is to put, uh, I guess I am putting a fine point, on something <laughs> that we started off with, which is, um, in my view, the, the, work of, the work that you're doing and the work that the committee is doing is extremely valuable precisely because of the fact that our committee is not going to be coming out with a preferred option or a single option to say to the town, here's what you ought to do, or to the superintendent, here's what you ought to do. The, the bottom line is we're looking at, um, with a set of key principles, which is why, and just say, and I have to clarify, for anyone in the audience who's wondering, well, why are you going through the process of defining a building program, why are you making decisions around, you know, whether building blocks is remaining there or not? The reason is because you got to model something. Correct. If you're going to come up with a series of scenarios and then analyze the existing building, building site and then come up with a rational analysis that's based on the expertise that you have, um, you got you got to set parameters, right? You got to compare apples to apples. And, uh, and so that's what you're doing. And the, the, the ideal goal out of this is that both for our committee, but also for the entire community, um, we should get, this is something that's echoing the superintendents at the beginning, we should get very useful information that could inform the public generally about the building site, but also get a good sense of what the trade-offs. So on, on one level, and I don't know how we're going to handle this, the committee hasn't discussed this, but um, you know, on one level, the key point of the report, and this is why I asked the question about zero energy, is it might be cheaper, I don't know, maybe it won't be cheaper, I have no idea, but I mean, it, whether it's cheaper or not to go zero energy up front, then there's the question of the long time operating impacts and the sustainability goals the town has versus 
not doing that, right? And, and I'm saying that only because I think in the end, ideally, what will come out of this, I'd love to hear your thoughts about how you're going to write up the report, um, is ideally the report at the end is going to be really deeply inform the committee and the public as a whole around what the trade-offs are, <coughs> so what's feasible on the site per se, with the building per se, but then also what are the trade-offs essentially um, between different options in terms of educational outcome, but also in terms of cost and other things. I'd love to hear your thoughts about how you're thinking and presenting it, if you have any thoughts at this point. Well, uh, the report will be in written form. It will be publishable. It will be uploadable, however the uh, committee chooses to convey that to members of the community. Um, from that, we can glean PowerPoint uh, presentations that kind of highlight the main features of the report, so that will be available. <laughs> Um, but in terms of some sort of matrix to evaluate, we haven't developed that with the feasibility mm -hmm. committee. We need to do that. Um, how do we, how do we, are we going to rank? We probably won't rank, but we probably should establish some sort of criteria, I would think, but we, we haven't had that discussion with the, with the feasibility committee. Sorry to put you on the spot. Sorry. I can't answer that tonight. Stay tuned. <laughs> Any other questions or comments, Mr. Demling? Yeah, so just building off Mr. Nakajima's question and, and your response, um, my, my, my comment on that is that you know, because we're not going to have a building out of this, I think the most valuable way to collect and present the information in terms of what the differences are between A, B, C, D, and E is, is just that, to articulate as clearly as possible what those differences are. And so, like, I wouldn't be looking, you know, to you or the cost estimator to make a qualitative value judgment about, oh, you should do C or A. I mean, that's big picture sort of discussion based on values and a number of different variables. But I, w I would want to have someone who's not familiar with the, the work to be able to say, oh, well, this is the difference between what you get with option B and option D. And then, you know, people can talk about the value there. So that, that's what I would be looking for uh, from that. Um, my, my bigger pic picture question is to what extent is the cost estimating um, factoring in the state of the site? Uh, and, and the site analysis that was done. Um, so I, I read through the, um, the draft um, site analysis document, and um, the part that I felt was most important and also um, kind of understated is um, the part on, on climate change. And um, so just the, you know, the two sentences that really struck me were, uh, in addition to the, the new floodplain mapping, the project team may want to consider changing trends in rainfall and heat associated with climate change. And I read that and I said, yeah, absolutely, we should be considering climate change. Uh, and then, you know, some more detail that I won't read through, but then the last sentence, today's floodplain may be much smaller than the footprint of tomorrow's floodplain. And I don't want to get into a big floodplain discussion, but um, it does, you know, dawn on me, you know, when I roll up to the biggest picture yep. view of, of wanting to project an investment for the next hundred years as opposed to the past hundred years. Um, and so what, what costs uh, will be associated with, one, not just building on the, the, the ground as it currently is, but um, to, you know, to what extent do we need to factor in building costs that are going to be resilient in an environment of the future where there are <coughs> rainfall percentages and the number of you know, category X hurricanes coming up the Northeast Corridor or higher, so. Well, well typically we, we design and have buildings built that uh, are expected to last 50 years. So I have never, ever been challenged with the question of what's going to happen in 100 or 200 years. Honestly, I, I can't, I, if you can help predict that, then maybe we can the, provide The number's it. not important. Yeah. All we can do is predict what we are, information that we are able to obtain from specialists. Uh, but going beyond that, it's like trying to predict the population of the, what's the enrollment demand? Uh, that far into the future, it's very difficult to predict. With all due respect, it's it's, a, it's quite a challenge. Any questions or comments at this point? I don't want to put you on the spot. Just want to give you a chance. Okay. Um, so I, I actually have uh, a couple of questions. I guess um, first, thank you for taking the time to present this. It's it's actually been really. Um, informational and, and, and educational and I think hearing what the feasibility study building committee has been grappling with is, is really helpful. Um, 
you know, I have I have some questions about the the level of detail. And we've had this conversation before because I, I do think that while yes, we want to set parameters, we want to be able to compare, you know, uh, like to like in terms of the different projects. At the same time, a lot of this is really just our best guess with the information that we currently have. A project may be very different, you know, five, 10, 15 years down in the future, right, when we, we actually come back to it. So I, I wonder at some of the decisions that are being made or discussed at the, you know, and maybe there's some members of, of the committee that are here that can help answer that, um, for us to be focused on some of these very detailed questions at this point, I guess I'm wondering what the deliverable actually is, because at a certain point, if we're just really looking for information that can help guide our thinking in terms of how to invest, you know, a in, in a capital project moving forward, if we have state as assistance or if we don't, um, you know, those those decisions are, so, are going to be so much in the air, right? Because, you know, state assistance may drive us down one path, and if we don't have that, we would choose very differently, right? Um, and so I don't know if you've had that conversation at the building committee level. You know, I, I would invite Chair Salvin to... Well, certainly, and I'll let any of my committee members chime yeah. in if they need to. We, we haven't actually talked about that specific topic of, of, of whether this project would achieve or not achieve state... Um, assistance and I don't know Eric I mean it's not something that has naturally come up so far mostly because I think our charge was, was so focused on this site this building um, and not necessarily the MSBA process and that and is, is that is that, that your question that's really? not yeah. actually yeah okay, I'm sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, no so so I guess what, I, what I'm asking is you know we, we're we're dealing on, on such a, a high level of detail yes. Uh, in considering all of these different options that, you know, may or may not actually come to fruition, right? Because it, it will all depend on what kind of assistance or what kind of project we actually end up taking on. And so I wonder if the committee has, has talked about that, about, you know, why go down certain roads and, and actually get to the point where you're even looking at six, you know, options, why not three options, right? Like, you know, why get to that level of detail Without knowing exactly what level of project we're going to end up with, I'm, you know, I just—it it was a somewhat organic process that we wanted to make sure we we were charged with and um, took seriously the, the charge of looking at a, a multitude of options. And you're right; you could choose a multitude that was three, or you could choose six. Um, and I think we wanted to capture a range um, between, obviously, new and renovation, and and make sure that we had explored a, a reasonable selection. Um, but I don't think we necessarily said we want to, to do six. I don't know if others want to chime in. Uh, I mean, uh, Anthony Delaney for Paradox. Um, this kind of goes back to, we haven't discussed this in a long time, but when we first started about a year ago, this was, we discussed this at some length about what exactly we're going to end up with at the end and where it went from there. And our assumption at the start was that this feasibility study, although our committee would take it on, take it forward, if the town wanted to, this would be the next step before we start talking about schematic design to applying for MSBA funding, and perhaps the MSBA would even accept this feasibility study as part <coughs> of their process. Or if nothing else, yeah. it would be a yeah. useful piece of information to to move the conversation and, forward. And, and to my mind, the level of detail we've been working at has been, has been very necessary to, to get us where we are, and yeah. with the assumption that even if this is this committee isn't producing a building, someone will. I think but you're asking why we have so many options and not just three. I think more is better than less. When we're gathering information, you start with a big range of options, and then you narrow it down. If you want on the next stage, you can narrow it down. But at this stage, we're in a feasibility. We said at least when we started the whole process, we started as saying the minimum that we were going to be required when we made the call was new, at reno, and, and just renovation. That was the minimum, very minimum that we wanted out of this project. But along the way, we say more is better. In this case, it's more information, more analytics, more like yeah. to choose. So why restrict ourselves to just only, let's pick, OK, A, F, and which one's on the middle? It's very, very different solutions and very different. So I think the whole purpose is they went evolving as 
feedback back and forth with the architects, with they came with ideas, they said, well, why don't we try this other thing? So back and forth and get more. Uh, I think it's also a natural organic process with the nature of the building. Um, you know, there's places where, and Richard can talk to this, where naturally you can add on, and other places where it's more difficult. Does, does that answer better? It the does, question? And, okay. and thank you for, for sharing that. I mean, you know, we haven't been a part of those conversations, so, you know, and we've had just limited mm -hmm. uh, sort of variations of that conversation, even yeah. with the Chair Salvin at our last meeting. But it's helpful to hear from the committee your thinking on this and how you've gotten to the point where you can you know, follow or pursue six different options and then think about presenting those as the final product for this end report. And I have one other comment, but Mr. Nakajima, it looks like you want to Yeah, I wanted to add, an, add something that had less to do with the number of options than the level of detail in some of the, in within the information that, that is being developed. And uh, my perception of that is that actually a lot of the detail was driven by uh, the design team, not by the committee itself. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not saying the answers to like, what do we look at, look at this and answer questions, but my point being is that uh, I remember the first meeting with uh, you after you'd been selected, you came in the door basically sitting down and peppering us with questions, many of them which were very, very specific around uh, what, is, what information you were going to need to be able to realistically model a potential school building and come up with information that would be defensible. And so in this case, what does defensible mean? Some of it is really related to site and expectations around the site. Um, some of it has to do, I'll, I'll pick on one because it was a favorite topic for a long time, was looking at special, ed special education space and um, the amount of space we have devoted to special education programs at Fort River is a great variance to what the MSBA would predict you would need to have. And so we were having this um, semi-argument back and forth um, that also ended up being largely driven by uh, an engagement with uh, with CPAC and with the, the, the district's professional staff to basically understand that under existing conditions, future school committees and school future administrations could change how we're doing special needs uh, educational programming. This is what we're doing now. And, and my point is, so we got into the weeds on that, but we got into the weeds because um, you could potentially have five or 6,000 additional square feet than what, if you simply off the rack, took it off the rack and said we're, we're modeling a blank template elementary school, then you would have had a building that was smaller in those areas. And A, that would be unrealistic. So the cost modeling would immediately could be thrown out the window when you're done because it wouldn't actually make any sense. And then two, you get into this public conversation where people would say, like the instant it's unveiled and said, look, this is a modeling exercise, but it's a modeling exercise that's been done with a level of rigor that you're actually going to learn something from this, is somebody who's going to open up the book and say, well, you're not even modeling the actual special needs programming we're doing right now. You're way off by, by you know thousands of square feet, and you're not actually matching what we're doing to help children and families today. So what good is this to me? And I'm saying that only because if from the outside looking in, you could you could look and see a committee that seemed to be like uh, um, taking toy soldiers on a field and modeling out the battle and sort of think acting like it's the real war, uh, to use a bad analogy. But you know what I mean? Like basically it, it, it's a modeling exercise, but you're being so specific, it seems like have you forgotten what you're doing? You're not really... You, this is not the stage where anyone's building a building. And the answer is, it's, it's in, it's, it was in the service of getting I uh, information back at the end of this that people could look at and say, not only does this reflect educational uh, practice in a way that makes sense to me, or it seems somehow realistic, it matches those principles that are put down. And then so you look at it and say, okay, now I get what the different variations are, and I'm willing to buy the the analysis may be a little bit better than I could otherwise. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was long, but I think important. Yes, well, it but is. our <laughs> arguments were very friendly all along. <laughs> oh, of course they were. Yeah. 
It, it is important, actually, and that's one of the reasons why I ask you know this question. I've asked it repeatedly because I think it's important to get this this on the record, right? I think it's important for us to hear as a community, you know, the reasons why we're going through this process the way that we're going, and that actually leads me to my second question, which is you mentioned this final report, which I think we're all looking forward to, um, including the, the the Fort River Feasibility Study Building Committee, and I I'm wondering if it, there has been any discussion yet about you know milestones or at what point throughout the next you know three months six months year we will we can expect different pieces of this to kind of come together right because as soon as we're getting information from this the building committee where you know this school committee is also basing some of its decision making I mean we're gonna be having a conversation on capital planning and, and on this agenda tonight um, you know some of that may be impacted at some point very soon you know by what ends up happening with with this report right so and not I don't know but because there, all this is up in the air simultaneously I think it's helpful for us to hear if there has been any discussion about how these different products will be rolled out we have had conversations with the feasibility committee and I believe we owe you a complete draft in January that, I, that's the current schedule I'm yeah. a little nervous we may be sure. a little behind our schedule but but if so it's only in a matter of a week or two at this point um, the the and I'm going by memory so I'm, I'm sure someone will poke me if I, if I get this wrong but initially we'd been hoping to have an initial um, kind of community outreach event uh, this week <laughs> yes I think it was actually this week and so but we were also hoping to have the the, fi the fi uh, cost modeling available for that and so we're a little behind on that so that that piece is a little bit delayed um, but the intent is to have uh, s some form of community engagement fairly soon um, get feedback just like we're going to hopefully get some feedback this evening um, Richard uh, will work to incorporate that um, and that will be then I think the basis for the for the draft at least of, right. of, of the final report we would love to have your input as well as anybody else so that we can then go back to the committee and say this is what we heard and this is I think how we need to edit the document but when we make our delivery in January or thereabouts yeah. um, then there will be another round of, of mm -hmm. revisions and okay. we haven't really established a public meeting um, community outreach no, we, we, that's, schedule. That's high on our list of things to do so, for our next meeting. So that's forthcoming. I don't know what that schedule okay. is, but after after every meeting, I'm sure there'll be another round of um, edits. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. This would be a good time to point out that um, I think uh, we our committee has done a good job of posting documents on the website. And so anyone who wants to go and look and find, and I think all the copies of, of materials, <laughs> nearly all. <laughs> and we're going to be, we're going to be on that point really soon. No, but I'm, but I'm being very serious about this because I mean, this is one of those rare opportunities. We're talking to a much broader audience mm -hmm. about what that committee is doing. Um, it, there's Amherst media, uh, is, is, um, taping every single, meeting I assume they're getting broadcast but presumably they can also go find that link where they want to there's also materials on the website for meeting minutes meeting materials um, like draft reports and things like that that have been shared um, with the feasibility committee so really it's a completely open and transparent in terms of what's been presented what's been discussed and you can find all that stuff we welcome you doing so thank you um, at the risk of adding complexity where I think we were trying to not do that. I just want to explain um, all of these different options here and how it, we were talking about over, you know, 100 options. A lot of that has to do with the fact that we're looking at a lot of... The mic, the mic oh, yeah, microphone. Sorry. <laughs> that we're, we're... Thanks. We're trying to look at multiple different ways of addressing the HVAC system, and so that's going to add a lot of... Even within option A, B, C, D, E, or F, what can we do? And I want to clarify something. Um, I think it was just misstated earlier. Everything that we're doing is in compliance with the net zero bylaw. That doesn't mean that every single option is net zero. It's compliant with the bylaw, which means that any new construction is net zero, and uh, but any renovation is also a dramatic improvement. So it should you know shouldn't be thought of as you know all or none. So everything is an improvement. Um, and we'll be able to give you, uh, we're going to have to formulate it in a way that's, that's uh, understandable to say, okay, for 
this option versus this option. This is what you can think about how it's functioning in terms of a green building and its efficiency. So that's all going to be part of the report as well, which I think is going to be very helpful in making decisions into the future. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Dr. Morris. Just one question that, that I got recently is wondering about not so much the specifics of phasing, but um, the construction timeline and the phasing as it relates to that. Um, is that something that you feel like in this report could be estimated? So option A would roughly take X number of months, years, whatever, you know, some combination of that versus option C. Is that something that you feel like yes. could be included? Yes, absolutely, we will do that. Thank you. I would assume that that would be integral to the, the cost modeling. It's integral to the cost model because time equals money. Um, extended general conditions, all of those things cost money. Um, but we will, we will simplify the description of it into X numbers of months Great. per option. Thank you. Any other comments, Mr. Dumling? Yeah, I, I guess I just didn't want to end this conversation without making the additional point that, um, you know, it's it's necessary to start with the assumption. If, so if, if we're going to, if this is going to be a means to an end to getting a range of cost estimated options to consider, we had to start with some assumptions. So we said, assume pre-K or K to six at Fort River. I think it's important to emphasize in communications um, to the public and uh, you know, from each committee. Um, that we haven't had any discussion for, as a community or as a school committee about whether we actually should build on Fort River and what that configuration should be. That's that's a, a bigger variable topic that um, has touch points with the unknown MSBA statement of interest process that you mentioned earlier, um, as well as the maintenance cost of um, the building of the of the uh, of the two buildings in the next decade plus. Um, so I, I, I find that on one-on-one -on -one conversations, very difficult to explain that there's all this good work, that there's this train that's moving ahead and it's going to be this community engagement and feedback, and yet it, it is not starting from a point where we have made any kind of value judgment that we want to build on Fort River. It's, I find it pretty tricky to explain, honestly, um, when I'm, I'm speaking with people. So I think it's a communications challenge, but I think it's something we need to continue to bring up um, so we can clarify what this process is and how that relates to the bigger picture. Oh, sorry. One way I find it helpful to talk to the public about that is we went through a feasibility study already with the Wildwood site. And so to me, and, and we never made it through a feasibility study of the Fort River site because on the last project it was pretty clear that for a one building solution to these two buildings at the Wildwood site was a preferred site and we really never dug down to see what Fort River would be like. That's what this work is doing. We're catching up to the work that was already done at Wildwood. Thank you. Yeah, it actually, I mean, I actually would say, and I think when town meeting was approving the funding for this item, part of the general discussion that happened at school committee and in town meeting at the time being was that's kind of the entire point of this right. exercise, is that, I mean, if we'd already made a decision whether we we're going to build here or not, then we wouldn't really need to do a feasibility study because apparently we'd know enough that we didn't need the information. Um, so the, the cool thing about this is that the, the entire point of this process is to say, let's get better information that can allow us to make better decisions when the time comes. Yep. Great. I, I, we didn't really touch on it, um, but re you know, regardless of what happens on the site, there are a few items that, that will be universally useful to the town. We're doing additional borings that supplement the borings, the soil borings that were done in the 1970s. Um, and we're having a new survey done, um, which will include wetlands flagging. So that, that's good basic data the town can mm -hmm. just use for whatever purpose. You also did the environmental study. In yes, I forgot about that. So all those reports are online. So there is a lot of information that's useful for the town Just the additional point, not to belabor it, but to add to what um, has already been stated, is that we have cost estimates for um, multiple size schools, but none of them were the size that is the preferred option um, that we're looking at here. So I think also it fills out some unknowns uh, that the community has about what are different cost options at different site size, um, site well sites, but also different school sizes. So I think it's an additional variable that's also going to be really helpful as the town has to face what its next steps are. So that's something that I also value. I mean, I think we'll, we'll now have a, a nice span of 
cost estimates and sizes and sites, which I think when the town's faced with making a critical decision, the more information, the better. And I think that's a critical piece from my perspective. Thank you. So in, in the interest of time, I, I do want to move us along. Um, I think that there was a question about feedback. I don't know if you've gotten everything that you need from us or if there's another process that you would like this committee to take. Well, we gave you a lot of information. I suspect that after you go home and you think about it, you'll think, well, I should have asked this question. I would ask you then to just forward your questions, perhaps through you, the chairperson, to the building or the feasibility committee, and then we can we can get that feedback that way. Great. Okay. Thank you. And I, I, in case people don't know, you can email the committee frsbc at amherstmed.gov, so you can just communicate with us directly, as you can with the school committee. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. We cannot answer directly. Oh, we we won't answer you, but <laughs> you. <laughs> You can you can let but us. We just um, it, it's just a violation of open meeting law if we start going back and forth. So, but we we all do read what you send us. <laughs> Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much again for taking the time to be here tonight. We really appreciate it, um, and we'll certainly send you any thoughts or feedback or comments. Um, you know, we have a, a usually a blurb that we take advantage of in the superintendent's newsletter on a weekly basis, sometimes, you know, every other week, depending on what our meeting schedule is. But this might be a good way to actually try to gather some more input and information from the community. So thank you so much, Mr. Nakajima. I move to adjourn the feasibility committee. Second. 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 <laughs> <laughs> We're all in favor? No, we got to vote. Seriously. You get to stay here. The rest of us can no, leave it. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much again. Really appreciate it. Because we have to reset up the computer for the next Sure. Minute, why so. don't we take a two minute? Uh, yeah. But if you don't mind, I really don't want to keep this meeting much longer than, oh, no, than no, no, our no, stated agenda. It's so going to be two minutes whether we take a recess yeah. or not. Just because, <laughs> Thank you. Okay technology so uh, if I can just get a motion to, to move to recess, recess for two minutes Second. thank you uh, so is this all in favor thank you. we are recessed yeah. thank you and, uh, so uh, calling the meeting of the Amherst Bye. School Committee back to order um, at 723 with thanks to everybody um, again from the Fort River Feasibility Study Building Committee that was here earlier it was a good conversation uh, but moving along now to our capital planning item on the agenda. And turn to you, Dr. Morris. Sure, yeah. I'm going to start, and then Mr. Mangano will take over about halfway through. So I want to just offer a brief piece of context for this. Uh, also, I want to apologize. There's one slide in your presentation that's in the wrong place, which you'll notice. So okay. for those who are following along the packets. So typically, we don't share this level of detail for capital items this early in the process. Um, and for the town of Amherst, as we'll get into, uh, as opposed to the regional schools, this goes to the town of Amherst to be sorted through with other capital needs, the regional schools, just for those people who may be confused because there's actually votes of the regional school committee for capital. That's not true uh, at the Amherst level in the same way. Um, and we'll get into that. Um, the development of the capital project, I want to thank Mr. McPherson, who's retired for our district. We thank him for his service, <coughs> literally combing through every single classroom in the elementary schools, all three schools, all the systems. Um, and the goal is that we know that there are multiple areas that separate from, um, I'll just be very blunt about it, if we got an MSBA tomorrow, we'll find out in December, but if we got in tomorrow, many of the aspects of the plan, especially in the first couple years, would be unchanged because there are urgent needs now in the buildings and they need to be addressed. Um, so I want to thank Mr. McPherson for his work. He's met with, he met with Mr. Mangano and I multiple times as we developed, uh, looking out five years, which I think is the reasonable amount of time one can look out at this. We'll go into great detail on the F FY20 budget, so the one for this coming, uh, the proposal for the coming year, this draft. But we also want to present the four years following because looking at one year without any context of the four years that follow I think we'll lose things there's also some unknowns as we'll talk about um, that we know will be um, costs will be need to be borne but uh, we'll, we'll try to be clear of when we would know the costs and how that would fit into a multi-year capital plan uh, I think multiple times this year you've heard feedback from um, parents teachers about the condition of the buildings and we've done the best we can and I'll update that later when we talk about facilities update um, and I think we're in better shape than we I know we're in better shape than we were earlier in the fall and what we know is if we don't take firm bold steps now 
we will be recycling these same problems, um, um, these core infrastructure problems in the future, and that's not acceptable to our teachers, it's not acceptable to our students, it's not acceptable to our community. So that's the kind of spirit with which we wanted to bring um, kind of this information forward. Do you want me to click, Mike, while you do your uh, piece? I'm close enough. Okay. Thank you, though. That's very nice of you. So just the process I described a bit. Uh, we'll talk about new projects, the five-year plan to restore schools. Uh, we'll talk about some of the planned considerations and then a calendar moving forward. I think it's worth noting as well that these, um, let's just think about the architect's presentation, and it will address some of those core problems that they also identified at Fort River, um, but it won't address the open classrooms, the sort of art, large-scale architectural <laughs> issues that are in any of our buildings. And it's really about the kind of the conditions, but not necessarily the teaching and learning direct conditions. I mean, they're all influenced by heat, cooling, um, water, other items. So uh, we're looking for you to review and offer feedback. We'll refine the plan as we get that feedback and more information becomes available. Uh, we'll look for feedback and approval. Votes not required in this particular year. I think that's a conversation we should come back to in December. Even though it's not required, it doesn't preclude a school committee taking a position on that. So I uh, want to talk a bit about that. Uh, presentation of a plan to pres uh, for the Joint Capital Planning Committee. Uh, and really an advocacy role that I plan to play and Mr. Mangano plans to play. Uh, we'll be having a uh, we were interviewing for a new facilities director this week, and that person will be a critical component of this as well. And then, to be very candid, we're looking for the school committee as elected officials also, wherever you all land with, you know, the final draft, also to play an advocacy role in the town. And that'll all come to the town council for review. Mr. Um, so just on process, so you mentioned that the school committee vote is not required, but it's possible. So, like, as you're imagining s scoping out this advocacy timeline, about when would you be looking for the, if, if the school committee was of the mindset to take a vote, yeah. when, when would be the most appropriate point? You wanna? Yeah, I'd say probably January-ish, because um, JCPC starts up pretty around that time. So you would want to have some sort of idea what direction you want to go in um, as you head into the JCPC process. I think one other piece before I transition from process is I also met this afternoon with the president of the Amherst Pelham uh, Education Association, Jean Fay, to review the plans with her. We, she's certainly close to hearing lots of concern from staff members, and it was important to us, it was important to me, it was important to us that she also be included in this process as well. So our primary for the considerations, we wanted to focus on safety. Um, you can see, you know, I won't go into the detail because we'll, we'll be there in a couple minutes. Uh, accessibility, improving the physical climate, and then preserving the asset that is uh, our buildings, our students, and our staff. Uh, we wanted to have timing of projects. That in, in one, uh, one of the projects in particular is going to be something that requires some, some pretty intensive discussion. Uh, we could start that tonight, but certainly in the next meeting. And uh, what can be managed operationally? Right, so we can't rip up everything in the buildings in the summer. Right, some of it's just functionally what we can do and how to phase that uh, that work to happen when students aren't in the building. Because much of this work, not all of it, much of the work has to occur when students aren't present. Uh, when funding will be available. So what we know is that our typical funding cycles um, are such that when a project's approved. Uh, which is in the late spring, is usually too late to actually, and the money becomes available July 1st, to, to procure work to happen that summer is a huge challenge. So oftentimes large projects get approved and the work actually happens the following summer um, if it's a large project that students can't be there for because companies are already booked by the time the money becomes available. For the, by the time we actually know the money is going to be available, vendors are already booked because that's, you know, five, six weeks from when work would start, and that's not a reasonable timeline for, for contractors. Um, and the plan assumes no new or renovated schools within five years. So if we were to get into MSB, we're fortunate enough to get in, as I said, next month, then that process still would likely take, you know, we tried to use a, a reasonable timeline uh, for that. As I said, if we, if, we, if we did get in next month, I would still be, years one through three in particular would be relatively unchanged. So here's the summary, and then we'll get into the more Sean Excel style uh, description of the, the longer range plans in a bit. So the HVAC at the schools. Um, so we had the major issue at Wildwood this year with the chiller system pumps and controls. Uh, that was, it was certainly the lar Wildwood is the site with the largest issues, but all three schools had issues with their chillers. Uh, Mr. McPherson ranked 
Wildwood certainly is the top, but uh, Crocker Farm was a close second. There were major, major issues classroom to classroom at Crocker Farm with heat, uh, particularly in the second floor, but not exclusively. And Fort River also had huge variability of how it managed um, hot weather. Um, I think in particular Wildwood, Mr. McPherson's significant, this is the one I want to talk to about timeline, because he's significantly concerned that if the work waits till the summer after the coming one, if it makes sense, that there's a really decent chance that the system will fail again. So when we get to discussion, I want to, in timeline, I want to discuss that a little firmer, because if we follow our normal JCPC town funding process, it basically leaves us, in his opinion, very vulnerable for a repeat episode of what we had this fall where we don't have cooling for weeks on end at Wildwood. And for me, that's unacceptable to, to think about that. And so I want to hold on that because I want to go through the list. But that's the when I pointed out, when I said earlier, there's one that might be a slightly adjusted timeline, or at least a request for that. That's the one I'm speaking of. Water fixture replacement at all three schools. There's 41 drinking fountains and food service water fixtures that didn't receive any work. I want to be really clear, this isn't a legal mandate, where all of our water is well below the <coughs> action level um, and what we know is that we've got multiple water outlets that are 40 to 45 years old, and they should be replaced. Uh, Mr. McPherson felt strongly about this, and, and I tend to agree with him that um, that's something that we shouldn't do, and we should not wait longer um, to take care of that need. We have Univents. Um, this is at all three schools. Um, so this would take care of roughly a third of replacing the Univents. So you could have the best heating and cooling systems put in, and if the Univents function is to actually realize the, the, the work of the HVAC system and the Univent in the classroom is not working properly, it doesn't matter how great the boiler is or how great the air conditioning is because that unit is actually the critical unit. Um, this gets to scale. There's just We don't feel like we could separate from finances. Just <coughs> could replace, a company couldn't replace that many Univents all at once. It's just not feasible to do that many. And Dr. Morris, the event, just to oh, I'm sorry, clarify, yes. <laughs> is the, the unit that basically pushes out the cold air and also pushes out the hot air. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And we know we're not operating close to any level of efficiency. And I'm both talking about energy, but I'm particularly talking about how much warm or cool air gets pushed out and its distribution. So this would be taking, you'll see later in the multi-year plan, taking two years to replace the unit events in the classrooms. Um, also with ones that are less able for small hands to drop pencils in and quarters and pennies and all those things that get in the way. So they make Univents slightly differently now than they did many years ago. And again, this is across all three schools. This is inclusive of Crocker Farm. Um, exterior doors. So as we've talked about a couple times, we are in the process of replacing uh, exterior doors. Um, and this would complete all of the exterior doors, door replacements at Fort River and Wildwood, which are the original doors, which at this point are warped. And it's both uh, energy efficiency, but it's also a safety risk of if there was a crisis and someone needed to get out of the room right now, some of those doors. We've, we're doing our best, and we've improved the situation, but they really just need to be replaced. Those doors weren't intended to last as long as they've lasted. So again, these are all projects for FY20. So the roof at Crocker Farm over the library. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Thank I you. apologize. Thank you. Um, so the replacement of shingled portions. So there's a part of the roof over the library and computer lab area. I think you heard about it from public comment in the past, and we had uh, our folks inspect it, and it just needs to be replaced. It's not a patch up. There's like structural problems, not structural like it's going to fall, but structural problems that can't be just patched over uh, as it relates to that area of the school. So it would, repl it would res resolve that. Uh, generator at Wildwood. So one of the challenges we have at Fort River and Wildwood is when we ever have a power outage, which I'll get into a little bit with electrical, um, because of the interior classrooms, it's incredibly dark and just not safe because there's mm -hmm. so little natural light. Uh, most of our schools have generators. The upside of the generator and the cost is this is something that could be, uh, I don't know a better word for it, but repurposed if there was a new building built. So it, most men, some of these things hard to imagine repurposing, but this is one that could be functionally repurposed. It you know, goes on wheels and you can move it to wherever you need it to be. Um, as we've talked about multiple times here and is referenced in the report that the architects did that all of you saw a couple months ago, uh, our electrical systems, particularly the ones at Fort River and Wildwood, are made by a company that no longer exists um, and had a poor track record of safety. This would be having an outside uh, expert come in and certify our electrical system to ensure safety and also to make recommendations of improvement. So this is the 80,000 is a cost of the certification. The unknown is 
what they're going to tell us. Um, so it's an $80,000 cost to both certify safety and then make recommendations for any future costs. Um, and we're assuming that they're going to certify them as being fully safe. It's, but we also uh, need someone to come in and look at that with an objective third third party eye. Um, the building accessibility upgrades at all three schools. So we've talked about this on this committee. This is the ADA audit that um, was approved and or we talked about and was supported by the school committee. So they've been out twice, I think, already. Um, and I think one or two more visits coming next week. Next week. And by January, we'll have an update on uh, what it is that they're seeing is in, uh, not compliant with uh, Americans with Disability Act and recommendations for us to consider. So again, this is a to be determined because we don't know what they'll find, but we wanted to have a placeholder there. Yeah, and, and they're meeting with, um, I think, some representatives of CPAC, either this Friday or, or sometime next week yeah, to get that schedule, um, yeah. some direct input from uh, the people who realize this you know, every day, some of the deficiencies. Yeah, so on the, thank you, yeah. this is great. So on the electrical system certification <coughs> item, <coughs> Is it, the, you know, your collective judgment that if the 80000 is just for the assessment and certification, then I'm taking it that that doesn't include any cost of repair or improvement to the system that they might find is necessary. Um, should we take that 80000 then as sort of a baseline figure of we know we need to spend 80000 but just between you know between us, we anticipate there's at least another X amount more that'll have to be spent that just simply isn't known yet. Or or what is what's the judgment? I, I think it's that's correct. I think there's probably going to be something that comes out of that um, that we have to do. But I think the other part related to this um, is that so when they certify it, they also sort of take ownership that if something happens during the period of time, that they will come in and fix it. So it's sort of like a insurance policy to some extent that if uh, a part that they certified breaks during the time span, however many years it is, then they would come in and fix that uh, piece as well. So I think there's going to be some upfront cost. They're going to say, we can't certify this piece unless you replace it. Um, but then it also provides some additional protection to the other stuff. But I guess sort of like a dumb, dumb follow-up question. I mean, is the, it, maybe everything's great, but if it isn't, is it, do you think that the, the uh, is the unknown like somewhere between $5,000 and like quarter of a million dollars or is it you know or is it known better <laughs> you know what i'm getting at like, yeah no it's okay I, I think it's a really big unknown because we haven't had this done so i okay. think um i think it could be between five thousand and maybe a bigger number than two hundred fifty thousand, <laughs> depending on i didn't um, want to be alarmist yeah. no i hear you but for all three schools um okay. it could be a big number so i okay. think yeah we won't know that until they do it and so i was going to pause before we go on to the five-year plan because this was the kind of proposed project for um, our, our draft of proposed projects for the next year, and then we could go, then go on to five year. Let's That's do that. So yeah. We can provide the, the committee a chance to ask any questions. Please, yeah. um, anyone have, Mr. Dunling? So um, you mentioned that you, you put this together regardless of what happens with the MSBA process. So I think that's a natural question is, you said it would be relatively unchanged, right? So let's, let's assume basic, best case scenario, that the MSBA meet, meets next month. Um, and that the, it, we're on the agenda, and that they choose us, and that that process screams along as fast as humanly possible, and the building opens, you know, put put every positive variable in your head, and then the building opens. It, does anything change on on this on the first year plan? So for me, certainly the ADA piece, because that's going to uh, my prediction is, and I don't, I'm not qualified to to know the answer, but by people who are more qualified than me, that's not going to be a small number. And I'm not assuming that we do all the AD stuff right away. Um, but I think it, it's one of the things that you think about what are the logical things that are truly getting in the way of access and what are things that, yes, code says they're, you know, um, not quite there. If you're building a new building, you wouldn't build it that way. Um, so you might make different uh, hierarchy of choices as you think about that, but we won't know until that report comes out. But as I go down the list, um, HVAC needs to happen, right? It's, well, I can get into more details on that, but, you know, the expecta expectation of how our buildings respond to hot weather needs to improve, and it's not just a, the system broke, it's actually the system's not functioning as efficiently as we need it to. The water fixture replacement, again, I feel really strongly about, given the concerns that um, we all have about drinking water. 
the unit events are functionally getting in the way of the even like new systems like we've new boiler wildwood which is functioning really well and improving and what's getting in the way is its work is being counteracted by inefficient unit events so I, I do think that for me feels strongly exterior doors is a safety risk so I wouldn't say that can wait the roof is leaking more often than we not at Crock Farm, so we need to do that one. Um, generator, I feel pretty strongly about. That's one that I could I could imagine reconsidering. Um, electrical system, I feel strongly about. Again, some ADA pieces I do. So I'm sorry that was I could have done that quicker. Um, <laughs> but but I think I I intentionally didn't because I wanted to stress that this is about making our conditions of our schools um, better for our folks now. And I think some of the things that have happened over the last couple of years, not just this year. I've created situations that are not consistent with what we value, you know, and how we value our, st our staff and our students, um, and we need to take care of that. Ms. McDonald. I just have a question on the, um, on the roof. The Crocker Farm roof is on here, but not the Fort River roof. And so just from personal yeah. experience, I know the number of buckets and trash cans that are collecting water. Several, yeah. You'll see that in the five-year. <laughs> you'll see it in the five-year plan. So there was some money approved this year to do some patching work that we just received some bids on. Um, so there's some money to do some short-term work to get it a couple more years, but you'll see it on the five-year plan. I'll point it out. Okay. So this this list, then these two slides, is just for next year. What we'd request year. to be approved for next year. Okay. Yeah. So um, I had a couple of, of questions Please. and comments. I think um, it's it's really helpful to have a list like this just to see you know both the the number of problems that we have currently in, in these buildings, which are not really that much of a surprise to all of us. We've been talking about it for a long time. Uh, but also just to see how much um, of an expense this actually represents, roughly. But that's actually, I think, where my question comes in, is, is just, you know, to, to understand, and I've asked this question to the superintendent before, you know, how, how did we come up with these numbers? Mm -hmm. I think it's important to talk about that publicly. Sure. Um, and then also, you know, those are the numbers that we are understanding perhaps to be an estimate now, but is there going to be a cost creep, you know, in the next year, right? Like, is there, you know, has that been considered at all? Because I think if we're going to be taking this and voting on it in January and potentially going to the JCPC into the town and going through that whole process, and then these numbers are not the right numbers, you know, what are, are we going back to them later on to ask for more money? Like, what's that process? Mm -hmm. So, if you don't mind, Mr. Yeah, Donato. I can provide a little bit. So, so there's always some risk, you know, when you're estimating these types of things. Um, I do know that Mr. McPherson was pretty meticulous with how he arrived at these numbers. There's spreadsheets behind these numbers that are sort of very granular um, with cost estimates from the most um, recent data. There's resources out there that give the most recent cost data, and so he purchased that information um, and he used it to generate most of these numbers, if all the ones that he provided. Um, and my experience with the things he's done in the past is that he's been pretty good and on target with his estimates um, in terms of the Summit Academy job. Um, I think the Fort River roof, what he's estimated is in the ballpark, what we'd expect after we got some architect numbers as well. So, um, you know, there's never 100% certainty, but I think what I've seen of his work is that he's put a lot of time into getting the estimates to err on the side of caution, um, but also to be um, defendable. So you're pretty confident then in these numbers? I'm confident in Mr. McPherson. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think to, and to put a, an additional point on it, so he used also, he purchased a book that is the kind of industry guidebook of estimating costs for different projects. And, and as Mr. Mangano says, there's Excel files behind all of these down to the univent, individual univent cost. Um, and he did use um, an escalation cost as well um, because the book is for this year, but these projects might not be done for not this summer, but the following mm -hmm. summer. So he has that factored in as well. Um, I think the challenge for some of these projects is, um, like the electrical is a good example. Like you don't know until you until you know. And uh, that, that can be sometimes a challenge. Some of the generator ones, like some of those are much more straightforward. The roof, we feel pretty confident in that because it's, it's a known, you know, it's, it's a little more packaged uh, what we're doing. The HVAC, even the chiller systems are, you know, they get delivered and then they get installed, right? So, and um, most of these projects would involve, um, they're larger than our maintenance staff can manage. So it's not like, you know, the summit at one was actually harder to estimate because we were partially using our staff, partially using other staff in contractors for different parts and these ones uh, even though the larger numbers are actually easier to estimate um, easier is the wrong word but they're less complex to estimate because it's all external vendors to do you know we, we wouldn't use our folks to put in a chiller system right that, that's something that the contractor is going to come in and do so it's a little more straightforward and then I think the, my only other question right now is about the electrical system as well I think um, 
Mr. Nakajima's points are well taken, and I also think that uh, I'm wondering if, you know, with something like this, it, you know, you're, you're bringing in uh, people who presumably know what they're doing, right, to come in and assess a system, right, fingers yeah. crossed, <laughs> um, to assess a system and then give us their best guess as to what the problems might be. But I'm wondering if maybe we don't cut out that, that step of maybe, you know, one option might be to just bid it out and then have, you know, mm -hmm. people who are also know what they're doing but can also do the, the actual repairs mm -hmm. come in. You know, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm just, I'm, you know, I'm wondering if there's ways to look at some of these, sure. these uh, things in a way that can help save some money, right? Because at the end of the day, we, we are paying a lot of money for all of this. Yeah, this is one I think we need to do some more investigation in terms of what firms out there do it. I did speak with a firm last week who actually did an energy audit of our high school and middle school. And they don't do this, but they know companies that do, and they kind of explain the process and how it works. Um, but I think once we get a better sense of what the com what companies out there are, are doing this, we can talk to them and say, you know, this is one option we're looking at. Are there other options um, more in line with what you're thinking? Mr. Nakajima? Yeah, um, thank you for raising that again. <laughs> because I think you started to articulate or um, jog my brain to articulate better why I was asking mm -hmm. the question I was asking, is that in my mind, uh, 80, 80,000 is a good, good, decent amount of money mm -hmm. for something. And I was trying to figure out whether you were, whether you thought essentially, your best hunch was the system was certifiable, in which case spending the money with a marginal additional increment to fix the systems where you're finding it sounds like a good investment versus this is like phase one of an enormous investment in these schools, in which case I was going to, I was going to beg the question as to whether or not, you know, why are you even trying to certify something that um, is never going to get certified until you put another million bucks into it? Right. Just to some extent for me, it's sort of like the ADA audit. We haven't had this done, so yeah. we don't, you know, we've heard things, we've heard things about the company, um, but I don't think we have a full understanding of the problems of, of the system, um, or at least I don't. Um, so I think in some ways this is really like the first assessment of what the problems are. If it comes out that it's a lot of work is needed, then maybe we change gears for the second year. But. I think I, I would want to hear mm -hmm. a little bit more once you talk about to the these process other companies, yeah, you know, yeah, and, and sort of what the lay of the land looks like for yep. something like this. Because, you know, again, if, if there are ways for us to cut costs, mm -hmm. you know, in some of this process, I, I think it's an, it's a valuable uh, show of, of um, you know, that, that we are thinking about this and, you know, we're, we're trustworthy in this entire process, right? I'm not saying that you're not, but I no, mean, not you know, it's just to, to be able to show to the community that their money is being managed appropriately and that we're actually trying as hard as we can to find ways to, to yeah. reduce it where we can. We'll definitely do that. And, and some of these other things, we're also going to look for um, rebates. There's state programs like the UN events. Um, that we got some figures that the high school and middle school could replace the UN events. There's That's state great to hear. rebates for that. So we'll pursue those things as well. Great. Mr. Dunlap? Uh, so, yeah, just briefly building on that. Um, I, I do think that that's one uh, a good example. I think I think um, uh, showing that you've uh, thought about potential impact of the MSBA, um, having a slide or two that more fully. Um, I'm, I'm saying on this in terms of advocacy, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of the future, explaining what the need is. Um, a, a slide or two that uh, further details what you described about um, how these numbers were arrived at. Um, a little, little more robustness. Um, just, just to show like the full picture of how well scrubbed this was, and that you know that the both the administration and school committee looked at this for a while, and we, we, we understand the the need and the urgency to address these, and yet we also made it as efficient as possible because it, it is a big ask in terms of a, a capital plan, um, and so I, th I think we need to make sure that um, that we communicate that we we've had the town's fiscal um, stability and as uh, much front of mind as possible. I think the additional thing, and I don't want to flip ahead too much because I think the five-year plan is the next, should be the logical next step, but it's also worth looking at in our last slide, which isn't in your packets, but it is going to be on this deck. Also looks at the last dude, five or ten, ten, ten years, thank you, uh, of what the approved projects for the Amherst Public Schools. And, and so, you know, to be very blunt about it, I, I, this is not a disagreement with anything that was stated, but this is deferred maintenance. So we've not been asking for mm -hmm. large projects for years, and part of that was we were an MSBA, and it felt really fiscally unsound to be asking for major projects while the town had just spent $400,000 on a feasibility study. Um, so I, I think that can't be understated. Uh, and, and again, 
what you're saying can't be understood either, that we have to have backup for the numbers and defensible positions. But I do think some of these things are, they've built up over time. You know, I think the town manager said it well at the four board meeting where he just said it was like a generation where there just weren't major projects done in the community. And I think because our buildings, the age when they were built, the way that they were built, uh, we're feeling the effects of that kind of generation of, you know, bits, you know, amounts of maintenance, but not kind of putting off parts that were 40 years old. Like we're at the point where we need to replace items. And I think we, we can need to do a good job explaining that as well. Yeah, and, and I think uh, just to be perfectly clear, yeah. um, from my position, all of this is absolutely important. Yeah. And we heard from, you know, multiple staff, we've heard from families, we've heard from the community for a while now. Right that these problems are very real and that we have to fix them. And I think we've also talked a lot about that it is deferred maintenance, right? Yeah. There's been a number of years, you know, decades in fact, that this work hasn't been done. So, you know, but I think that that's not, it doesn't take the place of the conversation that we were just having, absolutely. right? Because I think, you know, we can absolutely agree uh, that this work is necessary, or at least a you know significant portion of it will be necessary. The timeline, you know, I think is is sort of up in the air. It's going to be there's a lot of factors involved in that, mm -hmm. um, but being able to prove that there was a that due diligence was followed and that there was a you know a clear and collaborative process to come up with these numbers will be critically important Absolutely. in order to get anything passed. Yep, Mr. Nakajima. This is awful because it's going to seem like I'm beating a dead horse and I'm not meaning to be. Um, so I'm going to take a different cut on the electrical system certification issue, but it's building off of what, I'm not trying to be funny about this, no, it's I mean, but it's, build, it's building off of something that you were just yep. saying a moment ago, because I mean, you may, you, I know you know, but for the grand public, you may recall that, I mean, we wanted you to do this. The committee asked you to do this um, because at the beginning of the year, we were having a series of very uncomfortable conversations with the public in this and professional staff that um our deferred maintenance was starting to actually create an unworkable environment i mean look i'm not getting into an argument about what the conditions of the building are in general i'm saying if the if the chilling system is broken and deficient and it's 90 degrees out or whatever it is 95 degrees out you have an unhealthy environment because of these system failures, right? That goes beyond open classrooms and bad design and, you know, thin walls and all that kind of stuff. You know, thin exterior walls yeah. that are inefficient. And so my point is that there's an element to needing to face up to the idea that if we're really going to face this coming fall or this winter or whatever, um, additional circumstances in which we can predict different elements of our building systems are going to fail, um, then we have to, we have a responsibility to take action. I mean, and I think the town has a responsibility to take action. That's why getting back to electrical systems again, in my mind, there's sort of like, you know, certifying that the whole system is great or state-of-the-art or something like that seems like beyond me. <laughs> um, I mean, not, I'm not unimportant necessarily, but sort of beyond me. Figuring out whether there are actually systems, A, that are unsafe would be like really super important, and I'd really want to know that. And then figuring out whether there are electrical systems that might fail um, predictably over the next year, or year and a half, or whatever, whether regardless of whether it immediately results in a safety issue, would also be something that would fall in line with issues of like roof and HVAC and doors. I don't know if that makes any yeah. sense. Yeah, and I can give you, so I think what you said is right. Um, and just a quick example, when I spoke with that company, like for the electrical certification, one of the things they'll do is they take this little tool that they bring over all the, the wires mm -hmm. and they can sense the hotspots. And the hotspots are typically where you're going to have a failure or some sort of issue in the future. Um, so they can do that throughout the entire school and come back to you and say, you're pretty good or you need to rep replace all these sections basically um, with new wire, new whatever. Um, so I think, again, to my original points, I think it's going to kind of find those things and identify those things and either certify it's safe or certify we need to do some work um, to get it to a safe place. Yeah, I was just going to, less articulate than Mr. Mangano, share that my understanding from Mr. McPherson is it's doing exactly what you're suggesting you would want it to do, that it's it's doing the investigatory work to say, understand safety. It's not looking for state of the art. It's really just, you know, is it safe? Are there predictive fails? And what would recommend the next steps? And then it has that insurance quality that Mr. Mangano said that the things they certify, it's not like certified to be, 
you know, state of the art, it's certified to be safe, and then they own that it's safe. So they have some vested interest in the analysis as well. It's not just like, oh, we stop, we drop in, we study it, and then you never hear from us again. Um, and I think it, it incents them to give us the information that we would need. Thank you, Mr. Mangala. You're welcome. You want me to go to the next? Please, okay, okay. Um, so I'll go quickly through the five-year plan. Um, the first section is transportation. These are recurring items that we ask for every two, three, four years. Buses, um, special education vans, maintenance vehicles, things of that nature. Nothing really new about this section of the capital plan. Um, the next section is wildwood. So you'll see several items that there's like a recurring, small, fixed amount. That those are estimates for what are some of the preventative maintenance type things, the smaller parts that would have to be replaced and having an estimate for those types of things. Um, some of the bigger projects of Wildwood, you'll see the three million for the roof at Wildwood. Um, so that roof is not much newer than the Fort River roof. We haven't had the same issues as Fort River, um, but we wanted to get on the plan because it is at that age, a similar age as Fort River. Um, and we could foresee in the next few years it's starting to have those some of those same issues. Um, also at Wildwood, I'll point out the replacement windows. So you'll see $400,000 in a few years to replace all the windows. Again, there might be MSBA money for that sort of thing down the road. They have accelerated repair programs. Um, we had that for the middle school. We they, they funded some of that. Um, but it's sort of where we're at with Wildwood at that point in time. Um, and then the Mr. Univents. Donald, sorry, Mr. Oh, sorry, sorry. Just a clarification yeah. question. What is the color coding of the numbers? Um, so the color coding, so this is sort of the JCPC format. And the color coding usually means what year was it originally planned for? So if you look at the top, each fiscal year has a color. Mm -hmm. And below that, most of the time, the projects underneath that are the same color. But sometimes there's a different color, and that means it was either pushed back or moved forward. So for example, if you look at the bus, the school bus, 95,000, that was pushed back a year because the fleet was relatively good. We had the electric school bus um, that was put into place. Um, so that was pushed back a year. It was originally for FY20. It got pushed back to FY21. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then you'll see the univent replacement again. So in the next couple of years, we're hoping to replace most or all of the univents and then have sort of a recurring amount to, to stay up to date with univents going forward. And then the yellow sure, highlighted amount. Oh, yes. Mind if I jump in? Yep. So I think a number of times you're going to see places like the generator. You can see the 75000 and then a cost after it. And one of the things that we're trying to build in is we don't just need to replace some things. We have to put more money into maintenance. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that yep. Mr. McPherson noted was, you know, our team does a great job, but we actually don't fund routine maintenance that that these items need, and that really in, uh, accelerates the decline and, and disrepair of certain items. So some of the times you'll see these recurring numbers, um, usually they're not that large, and, and that's really around maintaining mm -hmm. over time because we, we haven't typically put funds into maintenance, maintaining those items. Yes. This may seem like um, a picky or, an, or eccentric point to raise at sure. this point, but I remember last year, I was on JCPC, mm -hmm. and last year there was like an endless argument um, that may recur this year or not about whether or not maintenance is an appropriate item to be funded mm -hmm. through uh, the capital budget sure. or whether individual budgets departmentally should be included, you know, eating the maintenance cost. So. I'm not telling you what to do. Yep. I'm just flagging it for you so that if somebody says, mm -hmm. why did you do that? Um, you'll be like, why didn't Eric tell me? No, that's good. He I was sitting it. on that committee <laughs> last year, wasn't he? And I don't know how it's going to be handled going forward. Sure. I mean, obviously, things are changing in town hall and yeah. stuff like that. But that's I a good thought, point. Because, I mean, by the way, I'm totally in agreement with funding maintenance. Um, but Yeah, you know. no, that's a good point. Um, okay, I'm going to... So, and oh, the, the last piece is those two yellow... Highlighted spots, so those are just placeholders. We don't know what the outcome of the ADA audit is going to be. Mm -hmm. We suspect if we get it early enough, uh, we'll put some amount in for FY20 potentially, the things that are really urgent, and then try to get the rest of it done in FY21, again, depending on how much comes out of that audit. The next one is Fort River. So the roof, uh, you'll see that in the second line down for $3 million. Um, Again, I think this is a good example of I think Mr. McPherson being conservative in his estimates. You know, we had an architect report that put the costs between two and 2.5 million. Um, so I think he's adjusting for some cost escalation by the time it gets done. But um, it's in line with what the architect was estimating, if not a little bit higher. So, um, pave the parking lot, 470,000. So he's got that for FY21. And if I could add to yep. that Dr. one, Morris. yeah, just um, he feels like there are areas of the Fort River parking lot that are not just patchable. That, that, that you know you can't just continue to add 
material on top of material when the material underneath is um, failing. So that's why, just because I think that always comes up, you know, at the region level we talk about parking lots. Uh, frankly, all we do is talk about parking lots. <laughs> we, don't, we, we haven't been able to take action on it, but that's, you know, I, I asked them an explicit question, can we have a lower cost mm -hmm and just, you know, cover some of the issues. But, you know, those of you who have parked at Fort River, we're starting to lose parking spots. You know, I mean, it's it's getting to that place, and he doesn't feel like an additional layer to cover over existing issues is going to resolve in um, any better outcome. So, mm -hmm. thank you. sorry, I just wanted to mention that, because the parking lot always feels like it's more expensive than it should be for many people, myself included. Um, you'll see some amounts here for Fort River in particular. Um, about the electrical service upgrade, so you'll some that's a placeholder for some of the stuff that might come out of that certification report. Um, it starts in FY21, and it's you know a pretty significant amount of money going out for a few years. Um, what else is there? I think that's most you know the same thing with the unit events, replacing most of the unit events in the next few years, and then having some recurring um, replacement going forward. And then the same thing with the ADA compliance at Fort River. Uh, Cracker Farm is below that. So Cracker Farm's probably in the best shape of the three schools. There's not you know, many huge projects in the next five years. Um, they've got some money for electrical service upgrade, but that system's obviously in better shape than the Fort River and Wild Little. Although sometimes it seems like Cracker Farm loses power more than the other two schools, <laughs> but I think that's squirrel related. So. Um, yes. So, but there's not many big projects at Cracker Farm. And just on the recurring else. point, because I think I was in that conversation. I remember Mr. Nakajima, the comment. But the HVAC pieces is just, that's another one. Of all of them, I think he feels most strongly that the HVAC, just you have to build in costs for annual maintenance. Because mm -hmm. even if it's a new system, just staying on top of new systems and making sure the HVAC systems are functioning properly is going to extend the life. And it's, it's money well spent in terms of the savings you end up you know, down the road. Yeah. And just a, a quick clarification. So if those costs were not going to be included, um, it, it, in a capital you know, budget, is this something that then the school district would have to absorb, or what budget would this come out of? Yeah, I think we'd have to consider adding it to the operating budget, or increasing the um, maintenance and supply lines for the facility department, um, shifting it from the capital plan to the operating budget. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then the last section is sort of overarching items that cover everything. Um, so energy management upgrade, um, we have an energy management system that's sort of out of date. I think this is sort of piecemealing, upgrading that system. Um, the electrical system certification, so the first one we talked about, 80,000, you can see it comes up again in FY22. So the, the thought process is that the certification only gets you so much time. It's not like 80,000 and it's good forever. So he th thinks it would be good for FY20, possibly FY21. We'd probably have to do it again after that, um, and it'd be a recurring thing in the future. Um, HVAC replacements, so this is some of the bigger units uh, for FY21, I think some of the chiller units um, and the air handlers around the building that would be replaced. Uh, interior upgrades is sort of a fixed rolling amount to do painting, furniture replacements, carpet <coughs> and tile replacements, um, things that just wear out over time and, and come up every year. Asbestos management, so as we do those interior upgrades, often we do have to manage asbestos, and there's some annual um, costs for managing your asbestos. Um, so this is just putting a, a fixed placeholder uh, in for that. Um, school security, I'm not 100% sure what the, and it's a fixed amount, I mean we typically do some camera replacements, um, uh, locks on the doors, some, some of our doors still need to be upgraded in terms of the, the locking system, so I think it's going to be used for things like that. And I can, Dr. Yeah, Morris, yeah, I can, sorry. Um, also, uh, one of the pieces of feedback we've gotten is that there are certain rooms where the um, PA system, mm -hmm. uh, so through our drills and yeah. through the things mm -hmm. that we do, that the acoustics are such that if you have a group of students in a small, the, the classrooms are all pretty good actually, but the small group rooms, so we do need to upgrade some of the PA equipment to make sure that 100% of our rooms in 100% of situations would be able to hear urgent announcements. So we've made some inroads that way, but we still have um, some of the small group rooms, particularly at the two, um, not older because Clark Farm's actually older, but the, you know, Fort River and Wildwood, um, just to make sure that the PA gets to all the places it needs to get to. And, and we've made inroads with our current you know, our current systems, we need to, do need to upgrade. So that's every time we do a security drill or a safety drill, the next step is what are some infrastructure challenges that emerge, and that, that's one that we're chipping away at, but we need to chip away a little faster. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, there, there's an explicit line for furniture replacement, so this would include desks, um, some of the uh, uh, office desks, but in particular the school, the desks that the students use. Um, and then the last piece is a new feasibility study. So I believe this is the plan of thought around this was that at some point, 
and we're going to back into the MSBA, and we need some amount of money in the plan to fund the, the town's portion of the feasibility study, which last time was about four hundred thousand um, dollars. So that sort of that that could certainly go either way based on when could we get move accepted. From a different column, yeah, different year. Yeah, okay. exactly. And so this is the updated capital plan. It's been updated quite a bit. Um, Mr. McPherson, really, like Mike mentioned, took a really hard look at it, um, went through all the schools, and put you know everything he could think of into this. Um, so you'll see that the mount's quite a bit more, but it feels more comprehensive as well. So one question I have that I don't see on here is, um, you know, it struck me, I was with my children recently at Fort River, mm -hmm. and we're out in the playground, um, and the equipment there is pretty new, mm -hmm. but not all the schools have new newer, equipment. you know, play equipment. There's also a couple of outbuildings, like, you know, exterior buildings. I think Fort River has, like, a bathroom, at, you know, sort of, mm -hmm. and that building seems to be in, in a lot of disrepair, sure. quite frankly. Um, has that been looked at at all? I mean, the, the state of the playground structures, mm -hmm. you know, those exterior buildings? There's lots of stuff here. <laughs> um, I don't know if it was explicitly looked at. Um, I haven't heard about it from Mr. McPherson. I do know that in the past, some of our playgrounds have been f replaced with um, grants or gifts. Um, from the Rotary Club, I think is how Crocker Farms got replaced. Um, Crocker Farms was replaced partially with district funds, but partially with CPA funds. Um, so I think those are other avenues we could look at, but we can go back and take a look at, at those two things. Okay. Yeah, and I think in particular, if I could comment on the, the bathroom outside at Fort River, um, my understanding, which I'm not 100% confident, my understanding is that's more utilized by um, town resources mm -hmm. because the fields are used for a lot of community resources I mean, the other schools don't have exterior bathroom spaces so that's something that i can talk to mr bachman about um not that i'm at, but just yeah. who manages that because it's it's i'm mean, not that our students don't use it at recess but it's it's actually much more common that s people playing softball or people who are there for community use um i think that's a little more the intention than it was specifically for the students at fort River. i'm sure that might be true but yeah. still regardless it's oh. you know on school property right and students are using it parents mm -hmm. are using it you know it's it's something that probably no should at least, at least be on a list you know yeah, yeah. are there and any other comments or questions and if there's other things you know like of those examples certainly send them our way um yeah mr Demlin? um so just probably an unfair comment and unfair questions <laughs> The unfair comment and, uh, you know, the spirit of uh, dead horse feeding. Um, you know, so when, when I look at the, the big roll-up picture here, so we're talking over 12 million in the last over five years, right? And half of that is the Fort River roof and the Wildwood roof. Um, I just really think that if, you know, if hopefully, you know, if, if we get in the MSBA process in December or February, or even a year from now, um, that is going to be the, like, urgent hope, the question on the big picture finance planning mind is that oh gosh is it would it be possible right. you know what, what if we did uh, 150 grand of patching what if we did 300 grand of patching could we not do three mil a three million dollar roof it's such a big chunk of this pie and and don't get me wrong I'm not saying that I don't think the roof needs to be replaced you know that's yeah. it's not um, I understand that you know the deferred backed up maintenance and now it's all you know coming coming home to roost um, I just I just think that um, uh, you know, we need to responsibly, but very uh, consciously wait until we absolutely have to replace that and then, you know, replace it. And if you think that that is FY20, it's FY20. If you think it's FY23, it's FY23. But um, I just, I can, I can just, I think that's going to be a very legitimate question for the town to ask as, as they're trying to manage a small amount of capital funds. Or fi I should say a finite amount of capital funds. Um, the, the other question I, I guess I just had is that, um, you, know, uh, you know, we've been talking about a lot of these things, and some of them are small, some of them are medium, uh, about things that were deferred maintenance since before the, uh, the building project. And I'm, I'm wondering why we didn't see a number of these things proposed last year. And I, I remember in, in our initial meetings after the, uh, the building project um, didn't go through that we talked about, okay, now that we know we're going to have these buildings for a while, what do we need to do in order to increase quality of life? And we, we sort of talked around the edges a little bit, but, you know, we didn't, we didn't get nearly to this level of, of proposal, even even for one or two years. And so I guess I'm just wondering what, you know, I mean, <laughs> that's why it's an unfair question, because I, I don't need you really to justify the past, but it, it, did, it did kind of strike me as, as this is something that, you know, um, I don't know, an ideal world it would have been nice to see last year, but there may have been variables I'm not thinking of at the moment. Dr. Morris. So I'll start with the first one. So for Fort Rivers Roof, uh, my understanding from the, our person who's expert on roofs is that it's the actual membrane of the roof that is 
uh, the concern, and we have kind of pretty long report that you all received last year about the condition of the roof. So um, I think it, it gets a hard play to do more patching isn't necessarily, uh, my understanding, going to be the, the long-term solution there. And what long-term is, is a hard thing to predict. I think if we were to get into MSB, the other variable is we don't know what that looks like. We don't know how long that process is. We don't know if that's taking, looking to look at a one-school solution, a two-school solution. So I think that's what's hard, and, and I think the calculus will change based on that. This is our current thinking, again, assuming no new buildings or renovated buildings within five years. I think you're absolutely right. We're going to have to revisit these items, and one of the reasons it's a couple years down the line is we put sufficient funds in that we feel confident for the next couple years. It's not an FY20 or FY21. Um, but I think you're right to say MSBA getting in may affect some of these things. I, I, Based on the report and the expertise that we've received, I think the Fort River roof is going to be a complicated. That matrix of decision-making with MSBA and the roof is going to be complex. In terms of uh, last year's plan, I think I think about that a lot. So I don't think neither of the questions were unfair, Peter. So uh, I want to be clear about that. So that that project ended, you know, if I'm remembering correctly, in March of 2017. Mm -hmm. So that's that's pretty much after the capital plan is formed for for the town. Um, and um, we think about this past year, we was trying to get some of these larger infrastructure things going. We're also it's not an excuse, it's just a reality. We're between um, facilities directors to do the deep dive into the building. So we did have some maintenance um, things. We did make some corrections. The boiler was a huge cost, if you remember. So when I get to facilities update, I'll share some positive news about the impact of the new boilers and the feasibility project. But uh, we needed you know, time to orient ourselves into the work and to have the right person come in and do the deep dive into the space. So um, I think it's a legitimate critique. So I think that's... Uh, completely fair, and I think it's this is where we are right now. Thank you. That's also a reason, though, why I think that um, this is going to be a tough process. I mean, it's actually particularly the point around the roofs and the amount of money that that costs. Um, I can completely understand the argument that we get into MSBA and the idea of spending $3 million on a new roof when you may be replacing the entire building or so substantially renovating it as to make that renovate, you know, the t that fix uh, generally, genuinely wasted money, so to speak. Like you can actually, from the schools, and I, I hate to sound um, uh, like a bureaucratic infighter, but particularly from our perspective. Yeah. So, I mean, if, if, the, if, let's say for sake of argument, the Fort River roof was fixed and the town uses the Fort River roof building for something and we build something else to replace elementary school it's awesome for the town that they have a fixed roof and that may be a factor in their consideration and funding it but if it's coming out of the school's hide in terms of like well we gave you three million dollars last year um then you kind of were like well wait a minute that's for your building not for our building um and so that's going to be complicated and genuinely complicated because also no one's really going to want to spend that money if we can see the end of the road in terms of getting a better facility um but that's why, that's why, to me, and this goes back to something I think uh, Chair Ardonius was saying earlier, and I've been sort of dancing around with my comments, is building a really strong case around this year is, I think, therefore even more urgent, and separating out this year's request, or even the next two years' requests, from the longer-range request is also really, really important, because... Um, I have no doubt that there's a bunch of this stuff we need in the near term that we absolutely need to do to ensure we have a, a, a decent enough uh, working, or at least a non-dangerous and non-tremendously unpleasant uh, living and working and learning environment um, in, in, our, in our schools. Um, so it needs to be, so the argument or advocacy needs to be bulletproof, right? It needs to be really well vetted, really well organized, and wherever possible, distinguishing off things that can wait or things that we understand are going to have variables associated with it from things that it's like, no, 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 I'm telling you, for a fact, you know, we, you know, July 1, we need to put this thing to bed. So. Yeah, I think we can do that. I think this first pass attempt, we, we took the approach of assuming no MSBA for five years because in the past we sort of fall into that trap of, oh, it's only a year away, it's only a year away, and that doesn't pass, and that's, you know, a long time away. Um, so this first pass was no MSBA, but we can certainly go back through and sort of highlight the ones that have variables to it, um, that maybe there's pieces that can be done um, to, to make it a little less expensive. Um, and the other piece is, 
the plane will get a lot more expensive too when we put the ADA stuff in there. So right now none of that's in there. I can imagine that's gonna be pretty expensive when we put the ADA upgrades into the, the plan. So I just have a, a couple of quick comments, or maybe not so quick, I don't know. Um, <laughs> none of this seems to be quick. So one is I think my question is really about, you know, that there's a, such a large degree of repairs and I know that Dr. Morris, you said that all consideration is being given to make sure that it happens, you know, during vacations, summer breaks, so as not to disrupt students, you know, learning and frankly put anyone at risk, right? With a lot of these projects you don't want, you know, mm -hmm various things can go wrong when, when things like that are, are being done. Um, so I'm just wondering if you can articulate to the degree possible, you know, what the, that impact would look like, right? If Assuming that all of these projects get approved and that we are ready to move forward, you know, February 1st of next year, um, what would that look like potentially? And if you're not ready to answer that now, mm -hmm. that's totally okay, but I yeah. do think we need to come back to the committee at some point for us to, to understand what that would look like, right? So that we can, you know, provide some input or feedback, or at least help share with the community what to expect, you know, with that whole process. Um, and then the other thing that I was gonna say is, is just, you know, back to, to the, the comments around the, the deferred maintenance, and I just keep kind of scratching my head looking at all of this, right? Because it's it's gotten to a degree where uh, there are no easy answers with any of this, and none of this is going to be cheap. Um, and it's really too bad, but that's just kind of where it is right now. And so I think, you know, by bringing this conversation to JCPC and to the town, we're basically asking the town to kind of make a decision, right? This is, you know, the, the burden, unfortunately, is going to be on the town, the new town council and on our community to understand the degree of repairs and, and deferred maintenance that have gone on in these buildings for so many years. And now we've got to fix this problem because we have, you know, hundreds of students, hundreds of staff who are in these buildings day in and day out. And many of them are actually uh, working in conditions that are, you know, sometimes borderline dangerous, right? I mean, it's, you know, there are, there are certain conditions there that we have done the best that we can to replace fire doors, to, you know, uh, repair electrical problems, and yet, mm -hmm. those are the conditions that we continue to have in these buildings. And so, I think we have to have a really frank conversation with our town leaders, and especially our new town council coming in, um, but certainly with our town manager, about the required costs that will go into these buildings that, you know, may be sunk costs, right? But they have to be done. So, we will try our absolute best to make sure that those are reasonable costs, that we're not adding extra money when we, we don't have to. But at the same time, that, you know, these are necessary and important repairs that are need, need to be done. Mm -hmm. So, okay. I, you want to start? Well, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> so, um, I think this goes back to the HVAC conversation. So, that's the one that's, I'm, most heightened by in terms of urgency and particularly as I said because if we follow the normal town process and I'm not necessarily explicitly suggesting we shouldn't but you can hear the implications if you like that if we follow that process you know Mr. McPherson said the odds of the system failing again at Wildwood he ranges between 20 and 25 percent um, that's too high for to have a repeat cycle of what we did <coughs> so that the hard thing is the process around that is is not the best process, which is, you know, outside the normal process that we have. Um, so to answer your question more explicitly about the timing is uh, likely, because I did have that conversation, some of these, like water fixture replacement, there are some things that, you know, we did that during the school year in the past, we can do that during the school year um, in the future, but much of these would be really shutting down the buildings for the summer, which we did at Wildwood this year, um, and particularly for Wildwood and at uh, Fort River, it would be not having... Um, programs. Cracker Farm's a bit more complex because Cracker Farm has our summer, all of our elementary summer programs are located at Cracker Farm. So the idea of shutting that school down for a summer is not a realistic solution. Mm -hmm. uh, so we talked about the HVAC system at Crocker. That can easily be put in in any time it's not warm. So that, that can be done in the winter while students are present without, uh, without any issues. So, you know, Crocker would probably have a different set of um, situations, but the Univent, some of those would need to happen you know, during the summer, so we might have to be a little flexible with our summer use of buildings. Um, there are community groups that do use our buildings at Wildwood and Fort River as well, and uh, much like this year at Wildwood, they would likely need to find different homes and locations. Uh, it's also very challenging for teachers, because I know our school year, their contract says 180 days, and the reality is, if you go to Fort River or Wildwood or Crocker Farm mid-summer, or mid-August, 
You'll see a lot of cars in the parking lot. It's not people with kids in the playgrounds because we have an incredibly hard group of hard working group of educators. And that was really hard for Wildwood staff. I'll really acknowledge that point. Separate from all the infrastructure challenges, just not getting in the building till August 15th was a was a real challenge for for our faculty. So the way we talked about it is trying to phase things like the HVAC system that potentially could go in. And um, while kids are in session, you know, just during the cool during cool weather where you're not accessing chillers um, and uh, exterior doors. I mean, that is likely a summer activity, um, as we you know we've talked about here. Uh, but we would really have to make a phasing schedule for all of these. We don't have it yet, but we'd have to make a phasing schedule of of when the work could happen. But again, because of our our current system of funding projects, much of this work couldn't be done till you know, the middle of the academic year to, to come, if not the following summer. Hmm. Ms. McDonald and then Mr. McEwen. Yeah, I uh, sort of I go back to the original assumption in this, which is that there's no new building in any of these five years. So even in the best case scenario, we get into MSBA. We're not, we're, we're going to be in these buildings for all five of these years. And so, I, I like the idea of the scenario planning and talking about the, you know, all of the reasons why these things have to be done during this particular time frame. But I think also that might be able to help is the scenario planning of what if we don't do it. Mm -hmm. And I think particularly about the, the two roofs, which are the biggest expenses here. Yeah. And yet there's a cost to not doing those. So whether it's a patch or the workarounds, the, the tubes and, right. you know, science experiments that are going on to divert the water from the books in the in the library, I think that that's a real cost mm -hmm. that's not necessarily in the capital plan, but it's coming out of our, our school's budgets. And so if there's a way that we can, and you know, not a super detailed yeah. <laughs> spreadsheet, but something that sort of brings that to life, that for each one of these big things, if we don't do it, so if we say, you know, this 400000 is too much to to put into the capital budget, what is the cost then that either the schools or the town will have to pay in alt, you know, workaround costs, yeah. right? Yeah, I think we can do that. I think the hard thing to estimate is like, what if there's a catastrophic event or a catastrophic <laughs> failure, you know, yeah. like the leak is in the wrong place, um, or there's a collapse of some sort. I mean, those are the things that are really hard to estimate and have the biggest impact. I think we can definitely estimate sort of the, the patching costs, yeah. the, that sort of thing. Um, also sort of the public perception costs, you know, people have choices as to where they send their students. You know, the roofs make a difference, right? For <laughs> um, when you walk into a classroom, you don't want to see all those things. So um, that's another part of the cost that would be hard to estimate. Um, but we can do definitely the recurring piece that's sort of tangible. We can do that. Dr. Morris, did you want to respond to? I did, if it's okay. So I think I think that's a great idea that you, you mentioned. I also think the nice thing is we now have uh, you know really robust set of information from the feasibility study. That I mean, if you, it, it wasn't planned this way, I didn't see this presentation until tonight. But if you look back at the the architects. Uh, when they talked about existing conditions, it was it was glossed over because it wasn't the focus of tonight's conversation for them. But they really aligned quite well with what we're suggesting here, which mm -hmm. um, which makes sense. And I think com creating a compelling case for all these items is is essential because people say, well, "Why do you need to do events?" And right, not just because well they're old. That's not a compelling reason. But we've got some really nice archival information, both literal images, uh, but also some really great information that our the team, um, the design team has created that are going to buttress support for this. So I think when we're ready for prime time, which is not tonight, um, really having a, a robust kind of narrative all, that goes along with each of the requests is going to be incredibly important. Yeah. yeah. Great. Mr. I think that's great because I think the, the uh, my point earlier about distinguishing between the sort of known urgency of year one or year two investments versus years, you know, three and three to five was not tr was not to have us undersell the urgency of three years, three to five in any way. I mean, I, I can't, not that, not that future people will care, but I couldn't even imagine if for some, for any reason, who, who cares what the reason is, if, if we're stuck with these buildings as is um, for the next seven years for some reason, and um, we could have fixed the roofs at some point and made advocated for it, and there was some significant failure that made the buildings um, substantially challenging to inhabit and work in and learn in, a pox on us, right? Which also means that if, if, we're, if, if we get into MSBA, there's going to have to be probably a much more robust um, analysis of what our alternatives are short of spending $3 million 
to ensure that we don't have some kind of a catastrophic failure, even if we're essentially patching in an process, interim yeah. to get to a new building or, or, or substantially repair a building. That actually wasn't why I raised my hand. I raised my hand because, <laughs> no, it really wasn't, but it was a great point. And it was sort of, I don't know, I like reinforcing good points and <laughs> making sure we head in that direction. Um, it actually is because, um, so f I hope you're building into your costs around summer repair, pest management. <laughs> I'm not so, joking. I'm not, no, no, I'm not joking. Okay. That's in the op that's in the operating. I don't know what that cost is, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but call Minuteman up yeah. and find out what you'd have to do if you shut down a building, you know, in like Fort River for a couple months in the summer. Right. Um, what does it cost for them to come in in August mm -hmm. and clear out the problem so that you're not clearing out the problem in September and October and early November, mm -hmm. right? I mean, and there's got to be a cost associated with it. it might just be five thousand bucks, might be ten. Sure. I have no idea. Mm -hmm. But but build that in, build in. please. Lessons learned. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Okay, so um, I'm not sure if there's we, one other slide. There's that's one other not slide. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a really quick one. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Two more slides. <laughs> <laughs> Done. So this is just um, the articles that were funded in the last 10 years uh, for the elementary school capital budget. So yeah. I just thought it'd be helpful to see the scale, and the scale is significantly different of mm -hmm. what at least this draft looks like and what's been done, but I thought it just was helpful to get a sense of scale. Um, and there, were, there was a lot of years with I mean, comparatively low numbers in there um, that we can't undo. Um, you know, I mean, I, in particular, I was looking and Sean put this together, but I was looking at, you know, FY10 to FY13, and, you know, that was before we were in MSBA, because we got into MSBA in 2013. So um, it's not to criticize any other former school committees or anything, but but I think when we think about deferred maintenance, it's been deferred for some time. So I, I want to, the, the reason I wanted this slide, and I asked Sean to put it in, this is not about deferred only because of MSBA. This is deferred maintenance that's been deferred for long before there was a building project that, that didn't pass. It's it's it has longer legs than that because I really I don't want I want to avoid just very literally because it's not true, but also politically anyone coming to a conclusion that this is somehow a response to a failed building project. This is a response to what the building conditions are now, yeah. right? And just many many things that could have been done in the past that aren't about 2013 to now is long before that. And some of the high years are actually paying for the feasibility studies. So if you look at 14 and 15 and 18, I think a lot of what's driving those years up is paying for a feasibility study. Mr. Demling. So, Dr. Morris, I'm, I'm so glad you brought that point up, and I would actually include, like, that FY10 to FY14 slide, mm -hmm. the pre-MSBA low investment in capital, because because it's, it's, it's absolutely true. Like, yes, technically there is a level of deferred maintenance that we would have maybe have done had the building project um, not been there, but, but we absolutely should not um, frame it as well, gee, if we had just approved the building project, we wouldn't have all this deferred maintenance, so shame on you for not voting for the building project. You know, it's like I can, obviously there's that emotional resonance, um, you know, that, that there is still some level of public attachment to, but, I mean, not only is it not politically expedient, but I, I think it's just not true. It's, um, you know, we, we have an absolute, um, uh, uh, we, have, we have to have a commitment to, to looking at what we have today without respect to the past at all, and just say, what do we have today, objectively speaking, and then advocate for that without any resonance in the past. Um, I mean, it, it, it's because it, it will, will generate the potential for that emotional reaction on, you know, in different ways. And I think the more that we can model that that's just not part of this calculus, the, the, the better we'll off we'll be in the community discussion. Agreed. So, thank you very much. Thank you. thank you, Mr. Mangano, for a very good presentation. Okay, so uh, moving us along to budget guidance, which I think is Mr. Rondano again. <laughs> <laughs> so this is similar to the region topic. Um, I sent you the indicators report a little late, sorry about that. Um, but that's not really the focus of the conversation. It's more, are there specific programs, initiatives, um, things going on in the district that you want us to bring back more information? have a, here a presentation from those, the people that are on the ground doing that stuff. Um, or other things that you just wanna, want to see uh, coming up in, in future budget meetings. We'll turn to the committee. I think, um, you know, we've certainly had a similar conversation at the regional level sure. not too long ago, but um, obviously the 
Amherst elementary level is a little different. So anybody have any burning <laughs> comments they want to make or Mr. Finley? Um, so like going through some of those charts of, of trend, sure. trends you, sh you showed, um, well, one thing I would love to have like a really comprehensive understanding of is, is, is all of the variables that go into managing a school choice strategy. Because we are a district where we have a lot of people that want to come and be part of our district. And we, you know, we, we have a, a wait list for school choices, as I understand. Um, and you know, we could, if we wanted to, we could be accepting a much larger number of school choice. And yet there is a cost benefit to doing that. And we, we talk about that sometimes. And I feel like, from my own personal understanding, I get to a certain level of, of awareness of that. And then it just sort of tapers off. So I feel like, I feel like given that it's, it's this volatile uh, aspect of the budget and yet an important aspect uh -huh. to be managed. I'd love to have a more like yeah. in-depth kind of overview of that. I think we actually talked about doing that um, a few months ago, coming back with like an overview. So it's, that's a good one that lines up with something I think we were going to talk about anyway. So, Ms. McDonald, I'm just going to look to you if you uh, if you have any comments that you'd like to add or. I don't. Okay. Uh, well, I'll just go down this. So I'll say um, I think that. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to hear a little bit more about is the um, food program. So I think we've heard a lot from the regional level, um, just about food service, and not as much on the elementary level. Mm -hmm. We heard about the school gardens and you know some of that aspect of it, but not necessarily, yeah. um, you know, both the success of the program. I guess there's been a, new, a few new things tried in the past year. Um, would love to hear a little bit more about that, you know, and, and if you see it actually correcting some of the past problems or, you know, if there's other things that we could be doing better there. Mm -hmm. um, but also just to hear if there's ways that we can help support that program a little yeah. bit more, um, you know, whether it's finding new sources of, you know, food from local vendors or other aspects like that, that I think are just, you mm -hmm. know, keep coming up for discussion around the community. Yep. That would be great. Um, the other thing that I would say is, uh, I think in addition to dual language, we've also sort of talked on the periphery around English language learners and, you know, sort of if there's an aspect of that perhaps in the other, throughout the district that we should be addressing and that we could be talking more about, um, I'd be really interested in hearing that. Um, so aside from the dual language program specifically, but just, you know, yeah. the ELL program more generally. That's funny. ELL was going to be one of mine. There you go. Um, so two votes for ELL. Oh. Uh, <laughs> no, because it, it also, also you, for a lot of reasons, being but we, um, you've also talked before about the wide diversity of languages mm -hmm. that families are coming, or are in our community, or come to our community with either way, and how programming and staffing to support that diversity of learners is challenging. And so I think it's just an, it's an interesting thing to learn more about. I'm also interested in learning about, I mean, I'm sure this is what you meant too, but in the context of budget, like in talking to the Absolutely. resources and the yeah. trade-offs we're making in budget, um, I would love to hear more about that. Um, the other subject is we, um, I guess intentionally, it seems like almost unintentionally or just by hook and crook because um, our high school media center um, director, our previous director, had won like a big award. And so we were having all sorts of like hullabaloo and learning about what an awesome uh, media program we have here. Um, I'd be interested in knowing what we're doing at, uh, at the elementary level. And, and again, how we're re sustaining, resourcing, how that's being utilized, um, what the stress points are, there as well. I mean, as well as good things, but I mean, what are the stress points there and how can we, uh, are there things we should be looking at? Could you clarify the last one? Did you say media programming? Library. Yeah, I'm oh, sorry. library. Okay, okay. I'm, I apologize. I, I, the, um, I wasn't sure if you were going like being, being Chromebook sort of, type things. Sort of or, like or, a, being, being an average person like you, yeah, yeah, I would use the term library naturally, yeah. but being st um, stuck on the Fort River Feasibility Committee <laughs> where the term of art endlessly used by the media designers okay. is media center. They've now beaten into my head not to use the old fashioned term okay. library, okay. which by the way, I adore. Point I adore taken, libraries. I got it. <laughs> so no, I'm talking about the library. Okay, gotcha. 
<laughs> but but also, I mean, not, not to sound fun, funny about this, but I mean, the reality is, yeah. um, the director here was was doing really yeah. interesting work. Yeah, the website and yeah. supporting cl cl classroom, integrating it with supporting curricular materials and links for study guides and stuff like that for the classroom as well. And I have no idea if that's going. And I don't know if it's going on at the elementary level, sure. but. Um, Whatever's going on at the elementary level, um, I'd love to learn more about it. But also, again, the key point is, where are the points of stress? Where should we be supporting in the budget or otherwise? And so, actually, there was one more thing that I just, something that you said, uh, which was, or that you said, I think, in response to him, the Chromebooks. Yeah. Um, so just in terms of technology generally, mm -hmm. um, along, at the elementary level, I think there's, you know, there's been so much focus and conversation nationally around STEM and the importance of STEM, right? And I know that we've had this very robust program. We heard from, you know, math sort of, you know, curriculum at the elementary school level. Um, but I, I'm wondering if there's anything else that we could be talking about just in terms of supporting that. And I'm actually, another thing too that I just have in my head is, is uh, the recent uh, media that's come out about the negative impact of too much screen time on very young children. Mm -hmm. And this is now, you know, study after study starting to show that children that are in front of screens for a significant portion of the day, it's actually negatively affecting their brain function. Um, and so obviously, you know, I think we've, in, at, at a certain level, at the school, you know, elementary school level, we've we sort of swung in the direction of trying to get our kids in front of computers as much as we possibly can so that they're not behind, quote unquote. But at the same time, now that this information is coming out, mm -hmm. I'm wondering if there's an opportunity for us to maybe kind of shift our thinking a little bit, right? And, you know, and if there's an opportunity for us to have that conversation around the budget, because if we are poised to make more purchases, you know, Maybe we shouldn't, or maybe sure. you know, there's something different, a different choice we could be making. Um, I just want to raise that to see if that's an opportunity for us to hear a little bit more about, you know, and and, and think about. Mr. Can I dovetail on that too? Is actually it's really funny because we, um, if we're going to use the term media center or library, <laughs> um, one of the things actually I really detested about that conversation is I love books. I love books, even magazines, whatever, you know, the printed, interacting with the written word. Um, I think there are studies that show there's a powerful impact on, on, on brain development and cognition and things like that, as well as also your ability to communicate and, and sense and grow as a person. And the different forms of media actually help you do that better and differently. Um, and retain information differently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and it's funny because Again, one of the arguments we were having on the River Feasibility thing was what size media center do you need? And the predicate seemed to be that we're moving into a world in which we don't need as many books on hand. And God bless America, or God bless Amherst, um, we seem to be a town where apparently we had a bias towards actually having books that someone could come in, peruse, see on a shelf, and engage with. And good for us. And so I'm, I'm, my point is I'm actually merging the two subjects because on some level they're connected. If you're, if you're pulling kids away from the screens but they're still supposed to learn and engage with material, then the question is how do they do that? And to the extent that it's interactive with, me, with the print and word, that's yeah. an important point, to the extent that it's not, it's in, it's in, in learn, other kinds of learning circles or formats, then that takes staff engagement and maybe engagement with classroom staff too. Anyways. I'm out of my expertise, but I was inspired by your comment. Good. So, Dr. Morris? so here's my uh, slight uh, push. Is so I heard five things: um, mm -hmm. food service, school choice, library, media center. One thing: um, English language learner program, and then Chromebooks technology. So, I'm just thinking. Is there a way to prioritize or space those out over multiple meetings just so that we don't end up in a scenario that those of us in the region last year fondly remember um, of our December meeting, which was incredible content that probably... One of the most interesting meetings ever had. Yeah, but... Over the, a space of like six hours. Right, right. So um, if, if there was some prioritization the committee was able to offer us, at least for the next meeting, that would be really helpful to maybe winnow the topics down. Not that we wouldn't do the other ones eventually, but... Um, you know, I, I'd prefer not to make that choice without the school committee's input. Mr. McConnell. And one that might we might be able to shift is the school choice discussion. We might be able to shift that to actually part of the budget presentation. Um, it'll be something that we talk about anyway as a funding source, and we could go into more detail as to how we arrive at 
We're using six hundred thousand worth of budget. Why? And how Looking did you get to Mr. that Mr. Dumling, who's nodding his head. <laughs> Thumbs up. So we could up. shift that one to January. Yeah. So does that help, Dr. Morris? I mean, we're down to four items at this point, and I, I, I agree. I don't yeah. think we have to do them all in one meeting. I don't think anybody yeah. really wants Mr. Dumling. I think you could maybe creatively, maybe not, um, combine the, the media library one with the Chromebook tech one. I was sort of in my mind trying to construct a generalized tech and wellness, um, you know, like if you're, you're a teacher, you're a third grade teacher, and you see this happening to your kids because and you think it might be related to technology, and you, so you do, you're doing something in the classroom, and then you go to the library and so you're engaging in some other media and you want to bring that together what and then you roll that up to your principal and say hey I could really use XYZ or this ABC isn't working as maybe I'm trying to connect too many dots into one topic <laughs> yeah I mean I think we could do two and two perhaps of the four topics and I think I agree with mr. Demling combining those two to be in one meeting makes sense because of the interrelationship between them Great. I don't know if that's agreeable to the committee mm -hmm. does that make sense mm -hmm. okay. yeah okay sounds good great to me. Thank, thank you so much I thank you mr. Mangano Okay, um, we are now about an hour past our <laughs> who we're supposed to be, yeah, but it's actually five time. yeah, it's you know. Eleven. Uh, let let's not say that out loud. It's just, it's just you never know. Okay, so the next item on the agenda is a UMass Study Donahue Institute report discussion, and so we had a conversation around this uh, previously, and so this is continuation part two, I guess. Yeah, and I think the guidance that I'm looking for perhaps is. Um, there is going to be a negotiation between the town of Amherst and UMass because the strategic agreement will be ending and there'll be a negotiation on a new one. And so I guess the one piece is their guidance that you want me to bring to the town manager. Um, he's the person who negotiates that agreement. Or is there a more formal role that the school committee themselves would like to play in that discussion? I think that's the kind of feedback I'm looking for. Um, and doesn't have to be super crisp tonight, but it's just that process probably won't be that far away from kicking off. and. Um, so I just want to make sure that if there's a will of the committee for me to play any role that I have clarity, a clear direction to bring to, it's not my, just, you know, I mean the town manager is his role to negotiate that, but if there's a role that you'd like me to play or um, a message you'd like me to convey that I do that appropriately. Mr. Nakajima? Yeah, so um, this may be a funny question, <coughs> but if, you're, if your immediate question for us is what role, if any, should I play, meaning you, mm -hmm. in the uh, negotiations with the university over some new town gown agreement? That sounds like it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the Donnie was to do a report item listed on the, in other words, to me, that's a separate question, mm -hmm. right? Like, I don't need to ever mention this report again to still say, I mean, trying to be critical. I'm just saying I don't need, I literally just don't need to reference this report again to, to say like two thoughts on what I think you should do to help support our educational goals in partnership with the university, right? Or am I wrong? Am I missing something? Yeah, so I, th I think, can I reframe? Perhaps. Yeah. Um, so I think, the, um, and I'm, I apologize, I was probably going too quickly. The conversation about the hour probably pushed me. Um, so the UMass, um, the Donahue Institute came, did a report. We were all present for that. Um, the idea of the report came from the prior strategic agreement, which indicated that that should occur. Um, it was supposed to then inform future agreements that would come from, you know, the two two parties. And I think in particular that report involved a significant amount of staff time, mine, Mr. Mangano's, and, and probably one other person on the staff, uh, and I was more involved than in other aspects of the, that agreement or that partnership. And so the, my recollection of the conversation that we had a couple meetings ago was that there was you know, a stronger interest in some of the kind of preferred outcomes or methodologies that were used, particularly the using the what the property would be if it was a normal property in the tax. There was a feeling that I felt from the committee of, you know, the per student, per capita thing felt, there was, there was a strong uh, neutral to negative reaction towards that. Um, so as I meet with the town manager, I guess I'm looking for, you know, we had a whole report, and is there anything that you're looking for me to do um, and communicate to the town manager as he goes into strategic planning? You know, is there particular... Um, role that you, the school committee feels strongly that the superintendent, not just me, but the role of the superintendent should play. I mean, those are the types of things because as opposed to every other document on that, that um, strategic agreement, 
it's between it's clear it's between the town and the university that's the one place where it's a little gray that the schools and particularly on the staff end my role uh, potentially has a has a role to play in advocacy so I guess that's what I'm sort of looking for I don't know if that helped at all actually but I thought I'd share it so here's I guess maybe I don't know if this is helpful or not but what I what I've been hearing from my conversations with community members around this topic is a, a couple of things one that you know focusing on a specific number of students in a particular development or building or neighborhood or district is not helpful. Um, it feels in some ways, you know, that it's kind of missing the forest for the trees. Um, while yes, the, the question that the Donahue Institute was technically trying to answer was, you know, brought into account the, that number of students, at the same time, there's a lot of other services and things that are in play here, you know, that I think a lot of community members have, have said to me, uh, there's, there's no way that just, you know, the university paying, quote unquote, for these students would cover all of that, right? So there's probably another figure somewhere that needs to be arrived at through a process of negotiation of some kind, right? The other thing that I've heard repeatedly from the community is that, um, the cost of educating each one of our students, which is roughly about $20,000 a year, is not in any way, uh, you know, it, it's, it's hard to quantify that because there's, you know, families here in town who've got multiple children who are not paying that much in taxes, right? There's a, there's a, a murky area here. So I think people are feeling some unease with trying to come up with a specific dollar amount and this, in some ways, feels a little contrary to my thinking because I, you know, I think, and I said this, I articulated this last time, that it feels like, you know, at some point we we do actually have to come up with a dollar amount, or you know, at least bring something to the table if we are going to negotiate around, you know, an increase potentially from the university. Um, but I also hear the community, and I hear how strongly people feel about this, and this is feeling like a, you know, sort of bordering on discrimination. It, you know, there's there's a lot of very strong feelings about how we are singling out people, and it's not a fair argument to be made, right? So, I guess from my perspective, my my thinking has shifted a little bit, and I thought to myself, well, maybe there's a way for us to, you know, if the town manager, for you, superintendent, or any of us, to advocate on behalf of the school district more generally. And to request that the university consider increasing its contributions to our elementary schools, and maybe we, you know, come come up with a number. Maybe it's you know helping us uh, pay for certain services. I'm not quite sure what that looks like. To be perfectly honest, I think I'd probably want to sit with this for a little while and, and yeah. try to come up with that. But it feels like people are looking for a different kind of negotiation to take place, um, and that I think it's ultimately our responsibility to help leave that to, you know, to figure out what that looks like, right? So maybe going to the university and saying, you know, is there an opportunity here for us to appeal to your, you know, uh, focus on education, your contributions to this community, understanding the value that the families that we're educating bring to the university community and more broadly to Amherst and start from that point, right? As opposed to just trying to focus on, you know, a specific number. So. You know, I think my thinking is still a little murky on that front, but it's that's kind of the perspective that I'm coming at from now, is just to say there is room for negotiation here. I think we all can agree on that. And what that actually looks like is, a, you know, a few rounds back and forth, but at least getting the, you know, the university to, and the state to agree that this is valuable and that it's important for them to contribute more than they have been for, for this. Mr. Nakajima and then Mr. Yeah, um, I think it's helpful. I would agree. I would agree with that. And I think one of the things um, that we talked about toward the end of our last discussion around the Donahue report was that um, the more helpful lens to look at the university's role in this process is that they're a large property owner in town, um, and yes, they're tax exempt, um, but. Uh, like every other property owner in town, they have a demand for services as well as they contribute things to the town. Um, and so the question is, when it comes to um, our schools, 
you know, what, what is a fair contribution that they could be making in support. I, I, I mean, I think the tenor of our previous conversation wasn't even neutral in the negative. Yeah. It was strongly negative mm -hmm. against in any way feeling like we're singling or picking out um, these students or this particular housing development. But also I think it really misses the point. As you were, as you were saying a moment ago, as the chair was saying a moment ago, um, you know, no, no housing unit in town covers the total cost of education of a kid that goes through the schools. Um, some do better than others, but that's only because, you know, if you live in a million and a half dollar home, guess what? You're paying more taxes than someone who lives in a two hundred fifty thousand dollar home, right? Um, it's the way it goes. And uh, and so the point is that's a that's an unpleasant and unwelcome road to walk down in general as a community. So I think the ethical place for us to be is to simply say, like any other pilot payment, um, you, you know, you're a member of our community. Um, there are costs that are borne by the town. There are benefits that are borne by all of us. And we would love to ensure that educational needs um, are included in that. The report, if anything, if the, if the report has any utility, the report simply documents the fact that if the university were to say, and I know they wouldn't, but if they were to say, well, yeah, but that's something we never draw from, right? Like we need roads and we need sewerage, but we don't need this then the answer would be, well, it's not really true because you actually do have families that live, mm -hmm. you know. But I mean, that, that's as far as I'd go with that, and that's assuming they made the absolutely absurd through the looking glass, you know, demand that they don't have kids in, the, in, their, in their district. Um, and then should you have a seat at the table? Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, th I think, you know, in, but I think this, the hard part is we already, we all know as ex officio members of the former town, town meeting, we already know that there are people in our community who would take a much harsher line on this and say, no, you should be reclaiming the per student tuition for every single body that's, you know, in our district. I think that's politically completely unrealistic. I mean, fiscally and politically completely unrealistic that's ever going to happen. I also think there are countervailing voices in our community that feel profoundly uncomfortable, as does this committee doing it. And so since that's a non-starter anyway, and also it feels like morally or ethically wrong, professionally wrong, um, you know, just get to the table, make the, you know, we're part of the, we're part of the conversation about supporting a good community. Helps them recruit professors and other professional staff anyway. Leave it at that. Sorry. Mr. Demley. So, so like when my property taxes are calculated or the property taxes of a housing complex are, are calculated, that are regular tax, it, it, the number of kids isn't factored into that, right? So, so I, I think the easy way in this first smaller problem of how do you account for the cost borne by the town and the schools for the students in the property that is not currently not taxed is that you you approach it with the same model that you approach. Uh, like you, 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 take, you do the mental exercise. You say, okay, what if this was taxed and it was on the market? And it was going for market rates. What would the town recoup in property taxes? Done. <laughs> like there, there is no variable there for the number of kids um, in the in the schools. I think that's pretty simple. I think that sidesteps the whole issue. Um, and and you know, leave it at that. Um, Except for you can't do then affordable. Like what they did. Forgive me for criticizing the report. What they did is they sat down with Assessor uh, Burgess, and they assessed the property taxes based on it being. You know, like an extremely low-income housing, you know, subsidized housing development with almost zero taxes associated with it, which was a BS exercise. Right. So, pardon so me for saying that. Yeah. No. So, point well taken. That's why I say like a market exercise, and that this shouldn't be that hard to do. You know, just sit down with some real estate pe people who run housing complexes today and say, okay, if it's on the market, you know, and it was just sold up, what would it be? And that, that has nothing to do with the school committee, or or the schools. You know, nor, nor should it. Um, I think. More broadly speaking, um, and I agree with Mr. Nakajimi, you should have a seat at the table. Um, I, th I think there are, you know, so, and then let the town deal with the other 25 issues of how does the university impact town finances and, and how much more should they pay back. In terms of the more positive aspects of, of a relationship, you know, there are many positive aspects of being in a university town. I mean, I think of things like, um, you know, we, we, we wonder about uh, can we expand the dual language program uh, years into the future and where are we going to find the staff for that? You know, we, we have thousands and thousands of students in this town. Like, wouldn't it be great if there was a teaching college, if there was, if there was a special program dedicated to training up 
dual language teachers, and specialized dual, lang dual language teachers who could, who could do special ed, or, or arts integration, or, or uh, a student project whose, whose final semester project was doing the website re redo for free for the schools, or, or, or would, would meet with us and say, okay, well, here's what you guys need to do to get modern in your promotion and your marketing, or a or hundred other ways. You know, we already have so many wonderful stories about individuals from the university and the colleges coming in and volunteering their time with career days, just one, you know, I was, I was able to meet a, a few people doing that. Um, so we already have this happening in an informal way. Wouldn't it be great if, if you, you know, you were able to talk in a non-combative way, you know, with, with heads of schools or heads of departments who said, hey, we have some people who love living in this community, how can they get back to the schools? And you saw a way that was, was both value add and, and, and cost efficient because it's things that we weren't paying for. So I think those kinds of conversations could be very fruitful. I, I just want to add, I agree you should have a seat at the table, and I'm not, I'm, I agree with everything everybody else has said, and I would add, the only thing I would add, I don't want to uh, add a lot of time, but um, is focusing on those um, intangibles, because, and, and not just from the benefit that we are getting from having a university in, in the town, but also from them having a great school system, public school system, right? So there's countless um, employees, faculty, staff from the university that live in the town, not on the on university property, and send their children to our schools. And the reason why is because we have a great reputation. So what if there was no school? Right? What if there was no public school? That would hurt the university pretty substantially. Right? So I think, uh, you know, bringing it, so I totally agree on the total property value, mm -hmm. because that's the model that our entire town fund budget is based on. Um, but also building in the intangibles because that's the argument that the university will bring to the table. It's yeah. perfect feedback. Does that give you what you need? It really does. Thank you very much. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you for, for leading on this. Okay, uh, moving us along. So the next item on the agenda is location of meetings. Sure. So um, this there's two, two two parts to this story, so to speak. Uh, so the first part is that uh, a couple weeks ago, Amherst Media Employee, uh, please, plural, uh, checked in with me to see, because there's so much work being done at Amherst Town Hall. Um, if you, it's actually pretty cool if you haven't gone over. Um, it's pretty neat what they're, what they're doing to make the council chambers, basically the old town room, into, there's been a lot of renovations, and part of those renovations have, have been to support really incredible technology and support for Amherst Media to be filming meetings there. And so there was a request from Amherst Media employees to see if we could think about moving our meetings there because it would really support them. It's, you know, one set of systems in terms of training of staff. So that's one whole slice of consideration. The second slice is that uh, we're not able to film these meetings live right now because the three cameras that we have are not working and the cost of replacing them is about $8,000. Uh, our contract with Amherst Media, which is a very fair contract, suggests that uh, they come, they do incredible, thank you Jody, incredible amount of work for us, um, free of charge to the district, but we're responsible for maintaining the equipment, which is a pretty typical mm -hmm. system. Um, I think the, the only other thing I'd add uh, before if there's questions or dialogue is that, you know, I've loosely talked to the town manager about this, you know, um, when our council meeting is going to be to make sure there's not conflicts. It's conceivable that there would be conflicts that would occur. Um, but, you know, I guess the question is, you know, should, is this a topic, if the committee wants me, I'll bring it more formally to town manager to work on kind of how the scheduling would work and make sure that he's comfortable. So I'm not looking for um, a commitment or an answer tonight, but basically whether this avenue is worth, the Amherst School Committee would like me to pursue uh, potentially moving meetings to the new, uh, to town hall, let's just put it that way, uh, based on both the request from Amherst Media and then the financial implications, because this isn't an Amherst public school building. This is a regional school building just to be put for the public who may be watching a finer point on it. It's not, it's not a building the Amherst public schools own. And I just want to also just add very briefly to that, that um, you know, from Amherst Media's perspective, not that I speak for Amherst Media at all, but I serve as a representative to Amherst Media from the regional school committee. And so anyway, um, the, the question was posed to them by the town, not, it wasn't Amherst Media's idea. So that's important for, you know, for this conversation as well. So I think Amherst Media recognizes the benefits um, of the, you know, the equipment, uh, both the centrality of the location and all of that, but this is not their idea. The town actually uh, has suggested it. 
So I'm going to open this up to the committee. Um, you know, I have some thoughts on this as well, but I, you know, welcome any thoughts that you have. Mr. Devlin? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's funny. Um, no, I, I, I approach a lot of our items in a very like data-driven, quantitative way. Get the research spreadsheeted up, right, and then talk to people, get different perspectives. This one, I come from a very, you know, I can't really make an argument as to why I like having our meetings here and why I feel like it's important, why I feel the benefit of the meetings here. And the best thing I can, the word I can think of to talk about is is environment. And I think that the environment that we have conversations in affects the the feel, the, the timbre of our of our dialogue. And I mean, I, I, I haven't been to the completely new renovated council chamber yet, so I can't, you know, comment on that. Um, but it, it, it I, you know, just from being on the Regional School District Planning Committee and going from the, um, the, uh, the Pelham uh, Library Room to the uh, Middle School PD Room to a Town Hall Room, it, 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 it affects differently how you, how you feel. And I feel like, you know, with the schools, because we're the schools and we deal with the education of children, which is a much more human service than, you know, say, I don't know, I don't want to pick a service. <laughs> I call it a human service. They're all human services. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not like we're trying to construct computer chips here and assemble them in a factory, right? It's something very disconnected like that. It's very, it's it's very human. It's very connective. And um, you know, it's funny. We were just talking about books and media center in the library, and I'm I'm looking at these beautiful stacks of books, and it it feels cozy. It feels like I'm in a school. It feels inviting, and and I feel like you know, not all of our conversations are like this, but I do feel like. They, we do have a, a fair bit of softness sometimes to be able to discuss things that affect kids, and um, I, I really value that. And I would, I would, I would worry about losing that for, for in order to save eight thousand so. dollars. But I, I'm open to different points of view. That's just initially how I feel about. It. Ms. McDonald, do you have any thoughts? I'm I'm um, I'm neutral. I, I, I can see I, benefits and drawbacks to either solution, so I agree with you. It seems sort of natural to be in the school for our school committee meetings, but on the flip side, I don't really have a problem. My only question, I, I do think it's important to have a live streaming of the, of the meeting, so whatever we decide, we should plan for that, but um, parking. <laughs> I think you know it, it's it's really easy for us and members of the public to come and park right here and, and come in very easily into this building and it's probably gonna be a little bit less so in town just because it's, it's not the only thing that might be happening and, and getting there so I don't but o overall I'd say neutral um, I think from, from my perspective I actually um, you know I, I appreciate actually having <laughs> This is going to sound funny after your cozy comments. <laughs> um, I appreciate having access to, I guess, the seat of government, as it will, you know, and having uh, it feel a little more official. Um, I think it's important for, it sends an important message to the community that the business of the schools is important business and that it's, you know, it represents a significant portion of our town budget. Um, I think, you know, oftentimes our conversations feel so removed from the town conversations that having a literal seat at the table where town business is conducted and, and done uh, is important to me. And I think also, you know, that the technological aspect of it is extremely important. I mean, I know, you know, I, just this week I've gotten multiple, you know, comments and emails from community members who were really upset because our you know, meetings were not posted to the website quickly enough. They typically will, you know, watch it when it's live streamed and they haven't been able to. And so there are some real, you know, issues at play uh, because, you know, we have an organization that is trying their absolute hardest to fill a need for us and it's all free. We don't pay for it. And so, you know, if, if we can make things a little bit easier for them and then simultaneously meet that technological demand that the community has come to rely on, I think it's incredibly important. Um, and I agree with you, the parking I think would probably be difficult. At the same time, I think, you know, sometimes we, we tend to get a little difficult here. So, it, you know, I think for me it's, it kind of swings both ways on that front. Um, but I do, I do kind of appreciate the idea of, of having these meetings, you know, be at City Hall in essence, Town Hall. Mm. Mr. Nakajima? That's interesting. 
I like listening to this debate. <laughs> uh, no, no, because I mean, it's, it, we often so much agree with each other, have variations on the same theme. It was really nice to hear two well-stated but very different opinions. Um, uh, so a couple of things. And one, I know, I know we're not in. Uh, actually, we don't have quorum for the other board. That's good. I'm glad we don't have quorum for the other board. Um, we're going to have to get a cost estimate for this anyway. So the other the other board is going to need to know what it costs to fix these cameras, because it I there I have not been able to square in my head how you would make other towns force other towns to go down to Amherst Town Hall to sit in the Amherst Town Council Chambers and make this collective decisions about all four towns. That that doesn't square in my mind in any way. I don't get it. It doesn't work for me. Um, so so in, and then maybe for that other board, they're going to decide they have to do it anyway. So we need to get a cost estimate of what it costs to fix these things in stream. Yeah, so that, just to clarify, that estimate is $8,000. We've done, uh, Jerry Champagne. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. you know, I'm sorry. I wasn't clear before. That wasn't like a off the tip of my head. Like I thought, he's, I, he's apologize. Priced, I thought it was. No, I said it uh, too casually, but no, he's priced it out. Our staff can, in, can install them, so we don't have to pay for installation. Okay. Uh, but $8,000 is, is his, you know, not just ballpark, I think it is. He's looked up the items yeah. and, you know, might there be some variance when he looks and actually purchases, but that variance is going to be in the sense, like in the number of hundreds, not number of thousands. Okay. So, no, that's a real cost. So I'm, I'm just, I'm, br sorry, I'm just bringing it up because for the virtue, for the purposes of this committee, it's possible, and I don't know this because the other committee has to discuss it, but it's possible that the technology will be fixed anyways and it'll still be able to live stream. And so that may not actually be the operative variable. Um, it's kind of an interesting question. I mean, it's kind of an interesting point. I, 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 I like the feel of being in the schools. Um, I also think it is good. It's a good reminder of who we're ultimately answerable to. Um, and I think it feels that way. Um, I actually, I do think there's an interesting dynamic that for some reason, having a select board in a school committee feels more in a town meeting feels more flat in which case yes people would nominally think the select board is more important but you know kind of like only sort of so much right it's like it's it was very horizontal form of government i think there's an interesting dynamic that when you have a town council um it's going to fee it's probably is going to be more powerful but it's also going to feel more powerful and to the extent that happens then there is a case to be made for the school committee, for this school committee, mm -hmm. to use either regularly or occasionally the seat of power to basically prove that it's a part of the seat of power. Mm -hmm. Because the, the bottom line, I, I, I don't know, I hope things go well, and it's all going to be up to us as well as everyone else who's involved to help make it go well. Um, but the bottom line is, I, I suspect that as a full town, people are going to be feeling their way about where the lines of authority are um, in the lines of decision making. And it's all with the best of intent. I think it's only because people care about the schools. So it's not, it's, that's the hard part, right? Mm -hmm. It's not actually out of any malignancy or any power grabbiness. It's because people care, and so they want to put it in their two cents because they care. And then what people have to work out are what are the norms of behavior that allow you to work collectively with your appropriate responsibility and responsibility to all care collectively together, but do so in your own lane and be effective in your own lane. Um, and I could I could see that working. I could see I could see using. I'm not even sure I'd make an absolute decision. I could see times where you'd want to make use of the council chambers just because you are, in fact, a legitimate, constituted part of town government. I don't know. You made things more complicated for me. <laughs> well, I'm also wondering, just on that idea, and Dr. Morris, I know yeah, you want to please. respond, yeah. um, is, you know, maybe if, if, if it would be possible for the committee to consider something like we have formal meetings at, you know, the town hall or city hall, I'm not even sure if it's, is it? 
changing names? Is it going to become a city hall? It's, it's going to be called Town Hall. Because we're, we're going to be the city yeah. that's known as the as town, town of Amherst. Right. Yeah. Okay, so, so. It's, to, it's Town Hall. For, for purposes of this conversation, I think, um, you know, maybe we, we do formal meetings there and then we find a way to do more public comments, more discussion in, in here, you know, like if there's an opportunity for something like that. I don't know. I, you know, it's, I guess I'm trying to split the baby. You know, you know one thing, it does, it, it's interesting. Cause, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'll answer one thing because Mr. Demling brought this up earlier is, um, and look, I respect the heck out of you guys, but because it's just us, I sometimes get a little bit surprised and disoriented that people who come in feel intimidated talking to us and mm -hmm. presenting. And I'm not trying to be a jerk about this. I'm like, I know people do, I've been told that, and I take that very seriously. Mm -hmm. But because it's just us, I think to myself, no, really, you shouldn't be that intimidating. <laughs> just come on up and say what you think. But the bottom line is we have to take it seriously. And so if this environment feels too intimidating for some people, boy, I guarantee you, a, in, uh, a somewhat ornate or formal looking council chamber is going to scare the bejesus out of some people from coming up and saying, look, I just wanted to share with you what I've been going through and what I think. So just two points. One is that uh, on the transportation piece, because I've done some thinking about that part as well in the parking, I think the only thing I'd offer is getting, if you don't have a car, getting to town hall is incredibly easier than getting here in terms of bus routes and things like that. So I think... I could argue the, trans the parking slash transportation both ways, but it is, depending where you live in town, most areas of town, if you can get anywhere easily, it's downtown using the PBTA, and that's not true for this site. So just something else to consider. Mm -hmm. I think the other piece that I'd be curious about, and Jody, I'm not putting you on the spot here, you're here working, but I would really be interested just in my working relationship with Amherst Media, having a clearer sense of what the benefits are for them. I I'm not suggesting that this conversation, which is about what's best for the school committee is important, but what I have, what I don't have clarity yet on is what are the implications for Amherst Media because they've been a wonderful partner with us and not that it should sway the decision, but even the way I introduced it, all I know is that they think it'd be better, but that's not perhaps enough level of detail and, and other people may have that, I don't, but I think just out of respect for our partners, just something that might be good well, to Well, would it be helpful for the committee if I were to go and talk to Mr. Mm -hmm. Lesko, the, the executive director, um, to get that, you know, at least his input on that? Okay, so we, uh, at least we can bring that back for yeah. another topic of conversation. Mr. Dumling? Um, yeah, I also want to say I really appreciate this discussion. It's, it, it is not often that we have um, very clearly articulated different points of view. And um, so, so I, in terms of process, I, I would like to like not like take an action or a vote tonight. I'd, I'd like mm -hmm. to take some time to think about the points of view that, that y'all have brought up that I have not thought of before. It's funny, as I was listening to Sardonia, as I was, I was, I felt myself swaying towards that point of view and seeing that, and then Mr. Nakajima brought up the fact of someone coming up and I'm like, yeah, it is very true when you're just sort of sitting in a chair. Um, and and it, it is one thing that, um, that I, I felt um, during our joint meeting with the select board uh, at the in, con in medias race uh, constructed council chamber, is that it did feel very walled off. Like there's a, literally a wall between the the counselors and, and where people would come up and speak, almost like a MacBook 1984 kind of business. Um, uh, so I don't know, you know, and, and maybe maybe you know maybe we go and we sample it. Maybe we have a sample meeting there and we give feedback to you know to the town and say we like the idea, but there's we have some significant issues with how people feel, you know, you know this, these are our suggestions. Maybe the town council will have the same or or similar you know reaction. Um, but but I, I am. I am open to, to, you know, and I'd also like to, like to ask people, um, I'd like to po pose this topic to the public and see, you know, between now and the next time you talk about it and, and see what they, they feel, because you, you, you both bring up some very good, very good comments. How could we do that? Well, I mean, I think that what I've heard from, from members of the community is, you know, in many ways I think they would prefer that we just sort of have a very, the no walls, no tables, <laughs> just have a back and, you know, easy back and mm. forth, right? And, and, you know, we, we hear that tension with public comments all the time. Uh, members of the community want more public comment, more access to our conversation and our di discussion. And I, you know, I completely hear and respect that. At the same time, there's still, you know, business that we have to conduct, right? There's the time of, you know, superintendent and staff and others. Mm -hmm. 
that we have to be respectful for. So you know, it's it's there's different perspectives there, and I think there's always going to be a tension there. Um, I, I like the idea of testing something out to see how it, you know, how people react, how it feels. Mm -hmm. If that would be something that's amenable, you know, I, I can ask that even of Amherst Media, if that's an opportunity for them to test it out and see, like, you know, does this actually work better? Or is there, you know, um, so if the committee's open to that too, maybe that's something that we, we try, mm -hmm. you know, once the town council has been, uh, you know, actually uh, inaugurated that we can try taking turns with them. Ms. Yeah. McDonald? I'm, I'm particularly intrigued or curious about the your, your, where you started to go about having formal meetings at the town hall and having sort of separate public comment or listening sessions mm -hmm. that might be more informal, ditch the tables, and, and have it as an, uh, just a free-for-all opportunity, maybe not four hours. but. Um, but it's an interesting thought because I've even in this environment, I I know that people feel intimidated, but I also feel very awkward sitting here at a table, <laughs> looking at people you know, talking. It's not a conversation, mm -hmm. um, and so maybe it's an opportunity for us to think through sort of different ways of reaching the public and, and the community and getting that. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think the only other point I'd raise to Ms. McDonald's point is that, you know, one thing that I do hear from time to time from families uh, and staff too is why couldn't the buildings, why couldn't the meetings be in the elementary schools themselves? The elementary, the Amherst yeah. school yeah. community. And it, you know, it really comes down to live streaming or, mm -hmm. or video recording and, and, you know, I think weighing those variables is a tricky one, but, but I, I do think it maybe it's an opportunity separate from this space versus town hall to actually think about how we do that too. So I just, I want to put it out there because that's consistent I feedback I hear routinely is why would you do it at the high school? Mm -hmm. Like that's not, like people even if they don't have like a, an understanding of like how the region's different than Amherst, it's more like, but we're the elementary schools. Like why wouldn't you do it at Crocker Farm or Wildwood or Fort River or some rotation? And you know, my answer is really unsatisfying to people who particularly don't live in Amherst, which is not a small percentage of staff. Um, so, yeah, like I don't watch on Channel 15 anyway because I don't get that. You know, so I just think it's another thing to put in the pot. Okay. Great. Keeping Thank it complicated, you. right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, facilities update. Sure. Dr. Morris. So I'll, I'll be brief on this because of time. So um, the good news, I've got all good news. Um, <laughs> So the boiler at Wildwood, um, so you heard about the Univent problems, but the consistent thing I've heard from staff at Wildwood is um, that in the past they would have periods where warm air would blow and then periods that cold air would blow, even if it was a cold day, that just the boiler couldn't keep up, essentially, is what it came down to. So once it, the boiler was over-exhausted, so to speak, it would just blow not so warm air because was, there was no heat coming. And so the reports, because we've had some pretty cold days already this year, is that there's a significant difference, that the, the climate feels better, it's warmer, and it's, there, there's never moments where it's blowing cold air on a cold day uh, and making the room uncomfortable. So thank you for your advocacy for the boilers. It's already making, you know, I know we had conversations last year and the year before about should we ask for the boiler because it's gonna, is it going to be sunk cost? But right now it's making a difference for, for folks at Wildwood. The second piece of good news is that the additional half-time custodian, we continue to, and today I talked to the head custodian, or communicated with the head custodian, we, it's continued to make a huge difference uh, for the, just the routine daily work that's required at Wildwood. Um, and so they're very appreciative of that. And the news that perhaps more of you are interested in is that it's been two weeks since we have a catch of a rodent at Wildwood. So mm -hmm. that eight-week window that uh, Minuteman suggested seems spot on. It's not to say that you know, we can't know if there are rodents. And they, they also expressed, which made me feel slightly better actually, not totally better, but slightly better, that they've had many, many schools in Western Massachusetts having significant problems this year. Uh, and they don't know why, you know, mm -hmm. but they're noticing, they're, they're getting more and more busy uh, than they typically are. And there's nothing um, meteorologically that would predict that. So they're at wit, not wit's end, I'm sure they're pleased with it, but from a financial point of view, but um, they're, um, they're not quite sure why, but they, they indicated that this is not the only school that's had about an eight-week cycle. Um, so we're going to keep at it. We're still continuing to communicate with Minuteman. They're still coming on a regular, you know, increased basis. Um, and so we're going to keep track of it because we don't, you know, it could reoccur, right? I can't, you never really say you're done. Uh, or if the moment you do, you probably regret that you did. But okay. what we know is the last two weeks we've had no, no catching of mice and all the 
quote unquote traps that we've set, uh, and no mouse sightings by staff. So that is the facilities update for Wildwood. Um, the other schools, uh, I don't have anything particularly to share that I haven't shared prior. So I just have a, a question. Um, we had talked about you know, the, the half custodian, half time custodian working on daily maintenance, but then um, not just at Wildwood, because I know that happened already, but having the weekend crews come in and maybe do some extra work. Yeah. And so has that come up uh, at Fort River or Crocker Farm or both as, you know, something that you've been able to implement? I mean, it sounds like there was quite a backlog across sure. the district. So we did do that at Fort River. Um, it was like late, it was after Indigenous Peoples Day, I think the weekend after. I apologize, I don't have the date off the top of my head. Uh, at Crocker Farm, the, there was an, ex, an express need, so we didn't, they felt like they were caught up well enough, and um, so we didn't put resources where they weren't requested. And there was a conversation with the principal and the head custodian, uh, but that did occur at Fort River as well. Um, okay. And I apologize, but I believe it was the weekend after Indigenous Peoples Day, and okay. you know. The reports from Fort River are they're they're doing well with the staff they have, and my visual reports not that I'm as fine tuned as head custodian, but visually um, it looks like the custodial staff has been able to keep up with the workload. Great, thank you. Any other questions or comments for the superintendent on this oh. topic? I'm sorry. There's one other thing. So we still haven't re-engaged Wildwood's composting program because we're oh, yeah. we're not rushing to put mm -hmm. that back in. We're going to take time and just make sure that this positive development of two weeks continues before we ease back or ease our way back into that process. Because that would be a logical question. You know, that was suspended. Are we going to put it back in place? But we've we've opted to be conservative in our approach towards that. Is there anything about lo location or how it's housed that would the composting? Oh. Uh, some of it's that, but a lot of it from what Miniman was experiencing and what they were witnessing was just that um, it's hard to keep up with the cleaning of the bins. The bins go out, the mm -hmm. bins get cleaned, and just this, that was the lag time. They felt like there, there was a lag time when the remnants of food were still available that mm -hmm. they were concerned about. Yeah. Um, as opposed to trash, which is much more, you know, you put it in, you replace the bag, composting is a little more to it than that. Sure. So that was what they were, that's the report they gave us. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Next item on the agenda is the English Learners Parent Advisory Council Rep, and I believe we had this conversation at the regional level. Um, go ahead, Dr. Morris. And if the committee is amenable and Ms. McDonald's amenable to cover both districts, I think it's it's a... Right, it's a new committee that's formed in terms of the LPAC, um, or a new council that's formed. Um, I talked to Ms. Richardson. We're not feeling like we need multiple reps for different districts. Um, you know, frankly, the vast majority of our English language learners are at the elementary level uh, as compared to the regional level. So I don't want to presuppose that Ms. McDonald would either be interested or there wants to be more conversation, but given the hour, see if we can fast forward this one if we can't we'll slow it down um, <laughs> no pressure <laughs> yeah <laughs> well. i will do that okay <laughs> thank you thank Thanks. you very much Ms. mcdonald <laughs> okay uh dual language update dr morris sure. so that was um in the superintendent update i just didn't do it because of uh, it was on the agenda That's later right. so a couple updates um so the biggest the most significant piece of uh, feedback we've received over since December, November 5th to now um, has actually been from staff, some from families, but more from staff who have concerns about if the lottery is after the screening process, how that could create an awkward fit for families um, and students. The screening process, for those of you who, well, I'll just state it, is an opportunity where families come in with their soon-to-be kindergartner, they meet the staff, the student gets screened, they get to meet both can generally both kindergarten teachers, paraeducators, uh, related service providers for the screening process. The family gets to meet with the counselor, the assistant principal, or principal, talk about their child, and it's a really formative experience for families and for children. And so the concern was if the lottery was after that, we'd have this whole process where kids and families fall in love with the mm -hmm. people they're potentially going to work with, and then get into a lottery and have really mixed emotions about that process. Uh, and I, you know, we had not thought we were thinking so much about making sure that um, we get the most number of students able to be in the lottery, right, because we we're extending it beyond the typical registration time. So we're still talking and thinking about how to maybe make adjustments that aren't huge, not like, oh, three months before, or we're going to make screening till the end of June. But um, I do think it's a good point that I think it would be supportive of students and families if the lottery occurred before the screening so that it wasn't 
people, didn't, the students and families didn't have the experience of making relationship, positive relationships with the school, and then needing to make new relationships. Um, so I think we can do that, and we're working on some models with slight adjustments to lottery timelines, slight adjustments to kindergarten screening to be able to do that. But I think that was really substantive feedback that we're taking very seriously, and we'll come back a little more detail in December if, that, if we can put it on the agenda. Um, because that's something that um, we hadn't, you know, it's a lot of pieces, a lot of moving pieces, and uh, but that's the way this process was to work, that people give us feedback, we take it in, improve our product. Right. Mr. Dunling? Um, does screening happen, is it still central, or does it happen at each individual online school? Registration happens centrally, but screenings happen at the building level. Mr. Dunling? And is, is it more than just screening for potential services that might be needed, or is it is it truly this, like, Hey, break out the band, welcome to, you know, Croc Farm, um, I, kind of like, you know, into the community kind of thing. I just, I'm, I'm thinking about these, like, touch points, right? You're like, like if we were managing a brand, right, <laughs> for some for-profit company, we would, we would think about the user experience, the user engagement. Where do you have touch points with our brand? And, well, you hear Coca-Cola the first time when you're three years old, you blah, blah, blah. Um, so, like, that's kind of like an important point in the relationship, in the long relationship that parents have with the school and their choosing to have a short or a long-term engagement. So I just, I wonder about those, those first, form, like we said, formative. Experiences. We don't feed our five-year-olds Coca-Cola, to be clear. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think the, uh, the explicit purpose is it's a mandated process to identify potential learning or, or, or needs of students. How it functions, how our staff do a wonderful job with it, is an incredible open-armed experience of, yes, you may be asking a student to see how high they count, but you know, that could be done really coldly, and our staff do the opposite of that, where they're incredibly encouraging for students, and families are able to share their thoughts on their child, you know, with, again, either a guidance staff member or administrator. You know, I'm concerned about this. My child's anxious about the bus. Of course, at the same time, the child is always telling the teacher, I'm most excited about riding the bus, right? That's like a typical <laughs> kindergarten screening experience that happened many times for me when I was principal. But there are these formative experiences, and if you're four or five, when you go in, even if someone's asking you to count, they're doing it in a way where you're building that relationship. So, yes, there's scores being written down and we are assessing, uh, but on a functional level, I don't believe the most incoming kindergartners view it that way. They, they're, doing, they're viewing activities with people who might be their teacher. You know, that's, that's the mindset that we experience our students and families coming in with it. So, I think it's both, um, but um, the explicit purpose is to screen for potential disabilities as part of our child find requirements. Did that answer? Question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't want to blow it up off topic too much. I just, I, I just wonder about these opportunities, right? Of like, you know, you have somebody coming in, you know, and it's 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 no guarantee that they'll, you know, a child who starts kindergarten is going to be with us their entire school career, right? And so, what's 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 an opportunity where we can even make that, you know, the the, the best, the, the most positive experience it can be, you know, before, during, and after, you know, like. I mean, even silly things like, you know, like a coffee mug or a magnet, it's like, I'm not necessarily that idea, but like just ways to invest and just make it, you know. I'm wondering if maybe we could have a, uh, this be an agenda topic at a future meeting, not specifically a screening, but just the early experience, I guess, of our students coming into the elementary mm -hmm. schools, right? Because, you know, ultimately, like, that you're right, I think that there's that experience that, that they encounter, whether they're coming in as new kindergartners or preschoolers mm -hmm. or, you know, later grades, um, but just understanding what that looks like and, you know, and seeing if there's ways that we can help support that might be mm -hmm. good. Yeah, and I think just briefly, not to answer that question, but I do think it's worth mentioning, some of what you did, you're suggesting we started last year by having a, a pre-registration event that we had 60 folks come to, that there was no paper, I mean, there was paperwork if they wanted to fill it out when they went to register, so it would be facilitate their going through that process easier. But it was really just about, we had principals up talking about programs, we had our science you know, person, we had bumper stickers. We, we, so we did the, the kind of uh, kind of rah-rah enthusiasm piece. And many people brought their children. We said it was child friendly. So we had you know, food and Ryan Harb is there talking about food services and, and we miss Ryan, he's wonderful. We're so happy with Sasha. But you know, I mean, I think we tried to integrate that into another set of processes that didn't have the eventually I need to ask you how, how you can count kind of <laughs> factor to it. I mean, I think both are important, but um, it was purely on the, more on the, or more on the PR side than it was on the functional side. But yeah, we can definitely talk, um, bring that back. Yeah. Okay. Great. And going on, so um, we'll be posting on December 10th for Spanish teacher and the dual language program. 
Um, you can see the long list of places that we are posting. We're going to combine it. Education Week is a primary posting mechanism. We don't typically do because it's, it's pricey. Um, it's, the, it's basically the Wall Street Journal for educational professionals. If, if people aren't familiar, it's a publication that's, that's um, widely read, and we're going to combine it with the high school principal. Um, I know that's a different district, but I think it's worth saying. So we're combining it so that we're getting two high-profile positions out there to a wide group, a wide audience. Um, so we're actively working with that, as well as just for the public who's not reading this, Spanish language newspapers, um, radio stations, Facebook, we'll do some paid advertising on there. Universities in Puerto Rico has been recommended to us. Massachusetts Colleges and Universities, Schoolspring, and D.com, Mabe is helping us. and. Uh, what I always say tends to be the best is emailing it to st uh, 700 staff members and saying, hey, share this with your friends. Do you know anybody? Right? Like The word of mouth is undervalued, I think, and we, I think our HR department, they did something they didn't mention at the regional meeting, but we've been really being intentional about that being a mechanism for recruitment efforts. You know, you can do all the formal things you want, and if people are like, oh, yeah, they're looking for a science teacher. I have a friend who wants to move to Western Mass, and she's fantastic, right? Those, those type of things mm -hmm. are can get lost in the shuffle and we're being very clear and explicit about that. Um, Dr. Morris, yeah. just a thought on this. Um, there's a lot of also Latino professional organizations yep. uh, both throughout the state and throughout the country mm -hmm. that might be worth sending oh, yeah. you know, these notices to because it is a unique program and it's not something that you see in a lot of different districts. Mm -hmm. um, and those networks being what they are, people are probably more than happy to share you know, with each other. So. Yeah. If you could, if anyone here has any other thoughts on places we could advertise, not just that, but other ones, please share. Uh, the December 10th, some people might wonder why not immediately, and so we got some feedback based on other searches that um, right after Thanksgiving is not the best time to post jobs. That really mm -hmm. you want to post it sort of heading towards the um, winter holidays. Mm -hmm. Um, and leaving it open till the new year. And for better or worse, some people get to the holidays and say, maybe I want a different job, right? It's just like this reflective time <laughs> that uh, <laughs> the feedback we've gotten. It's uh, so legitimate, yeah. Yeah, uh, <laughs> has been, after Thanksgiving, people are generally pretty happy where they are, and after the holidays, less so, right? Um, so weird psychology, but um, this is what people who do this for a living tell us, so we're intentionally posting. So we're ready to go. We have the posting ready to go, but we're going to wait till the time period that, you know, has been suggested to us as best. So it's by the same mindset that governs gym membership. You know, the start of the <laughs> you're ready to just yeah. start new things. So, right. Yeah. Exactly. No, I think there's some truth in that. Um, and and particularly education professionals have time to think about it, and time to perhaps do an application. Um, so. Um, on uh, December 1st, Katie Richardson's going to Dual Language Leadership Network, which is sponsored by MABE, and you can see the presentations. So some of them really relate to topics that we've talked about, about uh, working on partner language and English language benchmarks. So how do you <coughs> set expectations for both the English and the partner language, in our case, Spanish? Um, and um, Ms. Fredrickson, I've actually met, and when I went to Cambridge, she was the facilitator of that meeting at Amigos. She's fantastic. Uh, talking about oral language and how do we get more oral language assessment in, again, looking at both languages and how does that work. And um, MABE always has poster sessions at their meetings, so looking at um, multiple successful programs and where they feel really uh, they're, they're knocking out of the park. One of those programs, you'll notice, is Campaneros, and uh, a team from Fort River and the district office are visiting that program in Wyndham, Connecticut. It's about an hour and a half away, so not too bad. Under December 17th, I'm seeing if I can go for part of that day. Um, I'm not quite sure I can, but I know Ms. Richardson, Ms. Chamberlain, a number of the staff members are mm -hmm. going to attend that. And a member of their team co-facilitated the La Siembra training. And if you remember that visual that we plan to use, which is the continuum of language, of literacy, mm -hmm. that was created by the that school because um, they were running to the problem of this, like, you know, false duality to bilingualism. And um, they themselves created it, which is now used in dozens of schools um, involved in this network. So. That's coming up. And the last thing I have, which is not written, is there was a meeting yesterday Ms. Richardson went to um, at the university to the point made earlier, just about um, working with other districts in Western and Central Mass who have programs about, you know, could you Mass or other schools eventually become feeder programs to supply teachers? There may be a symbiotic relationship between a university or a college um, having a strong relationship now that us and Holyoke and Southbridge, which is, you know, far but not that far, it's still closer to us than it is to BC, which is one of the other schools that is producing teachers um, for dual language programs. So, you know, there's a lot of logistics. We all know that universities, big, you know, just because of its size is big, and I don't, I'm not saying this negatively, but it's a bureaucratic institution, right? If you have 30,000 students, however many they have, sometimes things, you know, need some time to marinate and 
develop, but one of the best things that's happened is they've hired, uh, prior to this, this is for this current school year, they hired uh, a staff member who's on the MABE board, who is not surprisingly incredibly enthusiastic about our program. She's come to our meetings. She's been an incredible resource for us, and she certainly has a lot of passion for uh, supporting this. So we're at the very early discussion phases. I wouldn't say that this is tangible, but we're, Katie's, uh, Ms. Richards has been great about getting that group together of multiple districts in Western and Central Mass and seeing what's possible uh, with the university. So that's just another thing we're working on. Uh, and I have one Please. quick question. So we had heard a while back about some concerns from some of the teachers at Fort River about this program, and I know that you had gone and, um, you know, spoken with the, the educators directly, yeah. and it sounds like folks are feeling better at least and understanding more about what you know will actually entail the, if, the, if there's going to be any job changes or anything like that just wondering if there's any updates on that yeah so i went twice uh once prior to the vote and once i think the week out i think that we vote you voted on a monday and i think it went out on a thursday and i do think there was some miscommunication or or lack you know and i take ownership it's no one's fault but my own of of just making sure everyone had clarity on the processes that would be used, and I think it did resolve tension. I was really pleased. So um, at the curriculum day on November 6, which was the, the you know like 12 hours after you voted, um, you know I mentioned some of the great things we're doing in diversity and equity and the work we have to do, and, and I mentioned a bunch, and I wasn't pausing for effect. I was just listing like uh, the incredible work done by our saga group at the high school and LGBTQ uh, work. And I mentioned, in, you know, last night the Amherst School Committee voted, and there was a spontaneous applause from the Fort River staff that wasn't because I, like, had the, the – I gave an opportunity. It just happened, which was really nice. And, and then other staff members in the district got really excited about the concept, too. So um, that, that was a good indication, at least, of some of the work and um, that Diane, the team, did. And then I think I was able just to help clarify some – um, some points that were helpful for staff to get because everyone every time I've gone even if there's been questions or concerns every everyone's dedicated to the the program success and to the idea of uh, the dual language program it just got a little complicated perhaps on the personnel side and I think clarifying those um, points and Miss Faye was very helpful I met with her um, and she was very supportive in that regard as well um, kind of resolved a lot of tension that kind of came from not being clear on, on certain aspects of how it would be um, supported and how it would be staffed. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Dr. Thanks. Morris. Okay, um, so it looks like we have a gift, at least one, mm -hmm. right? Mr. Nakajima? I move that the Amherst School Committee uh, accept uh, a donation from Martha Olver, uh, check number 995353. Uh, to support Crocker Farm at the principal's discretion in the amount of $10. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, all those in favor? Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Olber. All right, uh, school committee planning. So, sorry, I'm just pawned it up. Yeah. So, um, I've got... Um, potentially having an ALICE update, uh, ALICE being the safety protocol, uh, which we talked about today, but we thought there was maybe too many agenda items just for the mm -hmm. committee, you know, so when the chair and I met, and I think we made the right call on that one. You could have gotten um, <laughs> Thank you. And uh, I'd like to do an update on the dual language, particularly the lottery, because mm -hmm. um, I'd like to get back into the conversation with the committee on that, not just the timeline, but the lottery more generally. Um, we likely will have a sense from MSBA by then. Um, they have a meeting on December 12th. And my understanding is that's the meeting by which there will be some discussion and potentially vote by their board on what projects will be accepted. So one way or the other, I think we just have it as it seems like it would be relevant to talk about. Um, I think locations of meetings is something I wrote down um, mm -hmm. to come back to. Uh, the budget guidance, at least the first half of that work. Um, and I think that's as far as I have for topics. Uh, yeah, I'm wondering if there's anything on the... Uh, oh, uh, Mr. Dumling, would you like to talk about the regionalization update oh. at the next meeting? Shoot, I apologize. Sure. Okay. And Fort River feasibility. And Right, and Fort yeah. River feasibility as well. What was the date? It's uh, December 18th. 18th, 18th. yes. Okay, great. All right, uh, I will take a motion. 
if anyone is so inclined. Mr. Dumling. I moved that we had an awesome discussion earlier. <laughs> a motion. No, I moved for adjourning. Do I have a second? I second. Thank you. All those in favor of adjourning. We are adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank please, you. Please send the warrants if you haven't. Oh. Yes.